Thank you. Uh, Scambia County Marine Advisory Committee meeting. I have 537 March 13th, 2023. I'm going to start with our roll call. Uh, Mark Moore. Any word on Mr. Moore's uh, I did not absence? See earlier today. I did not see anything. Thank you. Uh, Melissa Pino. Here. Glenn Conrad. Here. Clint Rutherford. Here. Joe Denman. Thank you. Uh, Derek Green. Got a message from him. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Gaddy. And Mr. Gaddy, thank you. Kathy Watson. Here. Carrie Freeland, I am here. Um, Michael Lewis. Here. Eileen Beard. Here. Thank you very much. We do have a quorum. Uh, I'd like to start with. <clears throat> The approval of the minutes, we were not able to approve the minutes for January's meeting. Everybody have a copy of the minutes for January's meeting? Do we have uh, any additions or subtractions to these minutes? I myself was not present. No changes to the minutes. Do we have a motion for approval of the minutes? I um, move to approve. Thank you, Ms. Pino. A second, please. I'll second it, please. Mr. Rutherford, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Minutes are approved. We have the issue of uh, the minutes from February 13th. Everybody should have notes of those minutes before them. Are there any additions or subtractions to the minutes for February 13th? Any changes need to be made? Do we have a motion for approval of the minutes from February? Ms. Pino makes a motion to approve. A second. I'll second them again. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. All those in favor of approval of the minutes from February 13th? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Nope. Minutes are approved. Glenn, like a new format, sir. It looks good. Mm -hmm. it does. Very clean and easy yes. to follow. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think it's on. <clears throat> so uh, this committee is uh, governed by the Roberts Rule of Order. Uh, everybody will have the opportunity to speak. Um, we ask that uh, you wait until the speaker is done speaking before we interject. Uh, please take note of what you would like to uh, ask or say, and you will have the ability to come up and uh, speak uh, when uh, we recognize the floor. Um, we do ask that you keep the comments to three minutes, so please get to your point direct, and uh, we will recognize what you have. When you approach the microphone, please come, when, come up to the microphone and state your name and address for the record. Right now we want to, whoops, let's go on to action items waterways management public workshop number two thank you mr chairman um the uh the waterway management uh the first waterway management workshop that we had a few months ago uh, this is a follow-up to that and um i would like to stop and recognize a, a couple of folks in the in the audience uh, the Department Director for Natural Resources Management, my boss, is uh, Chips Kirschenfeld. He's here up front. And we also have uh, Captain Keith Clark from Florida Fish and Waterways, 
Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission um, Division of Law Enforcement. And then I also have on the phone with me is uh, Phil Horning, and he is with Florida Fish and Wildlife Co Conservation Commission. He's in charge of their derelict vessel removal program. And um, as we have seen in previous um, uh, discussions on these waterways issues, derelict vessels are an, an item of great concern and we appreciate um phil being on the on the um on the phone with us and we're trying to get him on teams and uh, as soon as we can we'll we'll put him on there if if it pleases the chair what i would like to do first is review the uh the handout that i've given this outline and um and then i'll i'll uh, uh give it back to the chair and you can entertain uh, any any comments or questions you have I've also put my my cell phone and my uh, our email address marine at myascambia.com if anyone in the in in the uh, in the meeting tonight is uh, is interested in providing written comments or if you want to forward that to friends or or colleagues uh, or other stakeholders and they can provide some written comments uh, that's a, a good way to do that so that you're uh, your comments get are made part of the public record. So the the, the just a, on that first page, what I've got is just a general uh, uh, description of where we are. This this list of waterway issues has come from many different sources. We had an online survey. The Marine Advisory Committee and uh, public comments have been made over the months and years uh, regarding some of these items and issues. The county commissioners uh, get phone calls and often they'll uh, call me or contact me and send me referrals uh, for items of concerns to their con of, to their constituents. Uh, also, I've had numerous phone calls, emails, friendly conversations in the grocery store or, or the gas station, um, as well as my own observations as I've uh, motored and, and boated and, and uh, recreated. Uh, personally, and then in my professional duties along Escambia County's waterways. Um, the, the waterway stakeholders, of course, are residents, uh, both our waterfront property owners, riparian owners, and then non-riparian property owners, as well as our visitors, uh, businesses, both the waterfront businesses, uh, such as marinas, and then water dependent uh, businesses that may not actually have their storefront on the water, uh, bait and tackle stores, uh, dive shops, uh, boating supply, as well as uh, shipping and, and navigation. Uh, and we have uh, uh, Frank Patty Jr.'s here from Patty Shipyard, uh, one of our, our major uh, industrial um, uh, business owners and operators here in Escambia County, as well as boaters of many types, uh, motor boaters, sail boaters, uh, people that uh, use uh, human-powered craft, as well as swimmers and, and divers, snorkelers, and, uh, and also I wanted to put in here the living marine resources. These are stakeholders. These are the fish and wildlife that inhabit our local waterways that, um, that are not only part of the of our ecosystem, but some of these species are there for commercial and recreational harvest, as well as other products and, and uh, things like medical uh, research and, and products are, are uh, derived from these, these living marine resources. So I wanted to make sure I included them in our list of stakeholders. And then the values, not only is it the property values for riparian properties, but the tourism values. There's a a study that's, uh, that was put out by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in 2014 that measured the economic uh, uh, values of fishing and diving on Escambia County's artificial reefs. And that was $150 million per year, supporting over 2,200 jobs. Um, so that's, that's a, the, the tourism is a big part of, of the values that we derive from, from clean, healthy, and productive waterways. Uh, maritime commerce and, and transportation, the intercoastal waterway, the Florida Gulf uh, intercoastal waterway passes along our southern uh, waterways from uh, Big Lagoon and uh, Old River, that area over there, and uh, all the way across uh, Pensacola Bay and, um, 
down to the east through Santa Rosa Sound, as well as we have a major port at Pensacola, and we have a federal channel that goes all the way up the uh, uh, Scambia River uh, that services the industry and the power plant that that uh, that exists up in the in the river. So those federal channels also uh, part of that federal channel goes into Bayou Chico. Um, so there's there's a lot of, of maritime commerce and transportation that uh, that we derive from our, our waterways, as well as our our recreation, our waterways, the, the some of the things that I talked about a minute ago with in in terms of the living marine resources, those eco ecosystem services they provide us with with the oxygen that we breathe, as well as food and aquaculture, uh, raw materials, medicines, etc. So those are the values really that we are are uh, trying to uh, protect and enhance, and in some cases we have to restore. And then these two little bullet points, I want us to all remember that, the, that most of the major waterways areas are going to be, uh, this workshop is focusing on identifying existing solution and, and look for new solutions that may, uh, may be implemented. So um, any photographs that, uh, that I, I may display to, to illustrate some of these are not intended to um, embarrass anyone, but are intended to kind of illustrate broad issues. And indeed, some of these uh, photographs that we may display tonight and, and in future um, workshops may not be against any law at all. So I want to make sure that, that, we, uh, that, we, that we properly con uh, take those into context. So the, the first item is items, uh, and you'll see them, they're, they're bolded and underlined, abandoned and lost property. These are already in existence in Florida statutes, and you see the reference there. Uh, vessels can be uh, part of that uh, category. Uh, vessels that are aground, that's one of the conditions that are in Florida statutes in the derelict vessel uh, statute. Anchored vessel, this is sometimes uh, um, uh, misunderstood. Uh, some folks don't understand that there are actually rules that apply to anchored vessels, and those are listed um, in, the, uh, in the statutory references there. Uh, anchoring limitation areas, this is a relatively new tool that the Florida legislature has put into statute. You see the, re the reference there. Uh, there have been two recent um, uh, instances of local governments enacting that, one in the city of Jacksonville and then one down in, um, in Hollywood, Florida. Um, and those are relatively new. We'd sure like to see what their, what their experience is with those and, and learn from their lessons learned. And then at-risk vessels. These are a statutory category of vessels that there is a definition for that, and you see the reference there. Um, uh, boating restricted area. These are already in use, and they are, are part of the uh, limited authority that local governments have that uh, usually you see those in the form of no wake zones or slow speed minimum wake zones. We do have some, um, some areas that we exclude certain types of, of boating access uh, in order to protect resources and, and public safety. And then as I, as I observe, and I'm sure a lot of folks here have observed that there are, there are legitimate user, users of our waterways and, and, and anchoring in our, in our uh, calm waterways and our bayous and bays. And these are cruisers. These are vessels in navigation. And we, um, uh, we recognize that they are part of the boating community. They may be from, from other areas, but I personally um, uh, sailed from Pensacola to Key West and back uh, last year. And that was uh, 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 a very uh, interesting experience that I, I went through to see from those eyes when you're passing through an area where you may not know anyone or you may not know the waterways, but we're still uh, uh, required to be compliant with the navigation rules and you've got uh, other regulations such as marine sanitation devices that are that apply and then debris a lot of the of the um, of what we we deal with in, in our waterways that that diminishes the values of the waterways and can entangle and harm marine life is uh, is debris and these are covered under the Florida litter law 
the major topic that, that we've heard from previous uh, um, uh, discussions at the Marine Advisory Committee are derelict vessels. So what I did is I actually pasted the entire um, uh, statutory reference uh, in 823.11, that's Florida statutes, and you can read what are the, the, the exact words of what makes a vessel derelict and how uh, we can legally uh, uh, deal with those vessels. If the owner does not take responsibility, we often find ourselves in a, in a place where we have to utilize um, public funds to to remove that vessel from the waterway and dispose of those vessels. So that's, it's about two and a half, three pages worth of text there, but I think it'd be valuable for, for folks who may not have actually looked at that statute um, for them to help understand it. And I'm sure that Captain Clark and Phil Horning can help us understand if we have some questions when we come to that point in time. And then there are things like dilapidated docks and boathouses and seawalls. And these are regulated by the state and federal permits that allow these to be constructed over state lands and in the waters of the United States. And those permit conditions uh, require that these uh, structures are maintained. And then there, I, I, I have not been able to, um, to confirm whether or not Santa Rosa County uh, passed an ordinance. I've seen a draft ordinance where the, the local government uh, to our east uh, took, uh, took some steps or is considering taking steps or has considered taking steps to, uh, to regulate um, items and, and objects and structures that may be in disrepair. And then dumped vessels and de debris. This is that going back to the Florida litter law and you see the, the statutory reference there. Um, these are rules that also apply to vessels. Uh, effective propulsion is one of the statutory references and conditions that uh, may be used to uh, determine that a vessel is at risk. And you see the, the statute there. One of the main um, one of the main issues that that we have, though, is is enforcement. We are um, we're blessed with uh, enforcement of of uh, the state wildlife fishery laws and the uh, other laws that the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission Division of Law Enforcement is authorized to enforce. Um, but we've heard from Captain Clark um, uh, about the the challenges. That, that he faces, and I'll, I'll let him speak to that if he chooses to. But also there are, are, are many references in Florida statutes where the enforcement of many of these rules and regulations require the enforcement officer to be a, a, a law enforcement officer that is, is what we call a sworn officer that, that um, is defined by statute. And these are the guys that carry um, uh, the, the handcuffs because they have power of arrest. Um, we don't have those in our code enforcement. So um, we're looking for ways of, of uh, working with the county sheriff and uh, municipal police, city police, and, and the waters that are around the city. Uh, we invited the sheriff to be here tonight. His representative sent me an email that uh, he unfortunately had a, uh, a family commitment that would not allow him to attend. But uh, we'll keep the sheriff in our in our um, in our discussions and our communications. And one of the issues of that uh, for the uh, for for enforcement is funding. And I've just put some some personal notes uh, from my own experience. Um, in the uh, in the in the notes there, uh, fish carcasses. We've heard from uh, marina owners and and marina occupants and uh, riparian property owners, people that own waterfront property, that uh, fish carcasses, when they're discarded in the waterways, um, they can be um, a form of nuisance and. Um, um, uh, going to have to confer with the, the legal interpretations to determine whether or not those would um, be uh, included in those statutory references there under the litter law or the, um, the, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection surface waters uh, criteria. Uh, floating structures, there is uh, one uh, uh, floating, uh, it's a 
it looks like a dwelling on Bayou Chico that um, has been the the subject of numerous phone calls and discussions and a couple of emails that I have had and um, we're looking for any references that this floating structure can uh, can be uh, can, can be applied to this and other floating structures. The Florida Administrative Code, um, the 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 Florida Legislature. I probably should have swapped these, but Florida statutes. If you look at the next one, Florida statutes. These are established by the Florida Legislature, and oftentimes the Florida Legislature will authorize the agency, uh, such as Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, they'll allow that agency to come up with implementation rules. And there are, are, are processes, public processes, that, uh, that these state agencies utilize to establish the working rules that, um, that uh, um, uh, carry out the intent of the Florida legislature that are in statute. Uh, Florida Sovereignty Submerged Lands, these are the lands that are below the mean high water mark. There are instances of submerged lands, lands that are below mean high water, that are privately held. And um, uh, we, we also um, uh, recognize that, uh, that these, these um, Florida Sovereignty Submerged Lands go all the way out to nine nautical miles offshore. So the, these, these sovereignty submerged lands are state lands. They're a form of state lands, and they fall under the regulation of the division of state lands within the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, one of the uh, problem areas that, that fortunately we have not seen here as much as southeast and southwest Florida are harmful algal blooms, uh, what we call, commonly call red tide, but there are also blue-green algae blooms and these can significantly uh, detract from our utilization, our enjoyment of our waterways, and they can be a public safety threat. They can affect uh, fisheries harvest. They can cause uh, a shutdown of shellfish uh, and uh, shellfish aquaculture as well as shellfish harvesting water. And there's increasing evidence about the, the role of nutrients in these harmful algal blooms. Um, and then I just put a kind of a general uh, category because I wanted us to all understand that, that, that the laws are at the federal level. They're also at the state level. There is uh, local uh, uh, regulations. Uh, sometimes there's preempting by, the, um, by state and federal agencies over what local uh, 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 governing bodies can enact. Um, and there are existing laws, as you've seen here, a number of the, uh, the statutory references are, are existing laws. Our question that we need to ask are, are they effective? Do we need new laws? Um, and then, of course, no law is, is really uh, meaningful unless you have a means to enforce and then um, uh, prosecute uh, for violations. <clears throat> so... Um, uh, we go down the, the list here to live aboard vessels. These can be uh, cruisers or people that choose to uh, live on the waters of, of the state of Florida and they're uh, moored or anchored to uh, the sovereignty submerged lands. You see the statutory definition is, is listed there in Florida statutes. And then back to those living marine resources, seagrasses, uh, fisheries. Um, and other ecosystem drivers, and then we have threatened and endangered species that are are uh, regulated by the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammals Protection Act, and they're also regulated by the state of Florida in Chapter 379 of Florida Statutes. Um, local ordinances, again, these are often limited by the state legislature, but I've got some examples there of no wake and no, no uh, minimum wake zones um, and exclusion areas. Uh, one of the big problems that we have with, uh, with people that are residing aboard vessels and uh, floating structures is whether or not they're complying with the existing marine sanitation regulations and they're following the uh, pump out requirements. So you see some statutory re references there. Um, and then the navigation rules, the, the, the federal and international uh, rules of, of the, uh, there are two sets. There's the international rules, and these apply uh, 
at the uh, beyond the line of demarcation, which in our case is at the, the pass, Pensacola Pass. Anything beyond them, any boats are required to follow the international, uh, we call them call regs. There are regulations for the prevention of collisions at sea. And then there's an inland version of that. And I've got you the statutory references there, as well as uh, the Florida, uh, Florida uh, legislature has, uh, they have their own uh, vessel safety regulations that are generally in Chapter 327 of Florida statutes. Uh, back to pollution and water quality impairments. Uh, again, you've got the Federal Clean Water Act, uh, the Florida, uh, Florida Legislature in Chapter 376 and in 403. Uh, they also um, uh, regulate that. And these are, are sometimes they're legacy chemicals. There are chemicals that no longer are, are manufactured here locally, uh, but were manufactured in, in decades and centuries past that uh, the, because of the, the lifespan of these, of these chemicals, they're still working their way through our groundwater and into, into our, our water bodies, into our surface waters, into sediments. Um, and so we have to, although they, they couldn't be manufactured in today's world, they exist and we have to, um, we have to be aware of those and, and regulate them. Um, as well as there are, are existing uh, uh, chemicals that we produce and use now, things like fertilizers and new, uh, uh, herbicides and pesticides that, uh, that uh, also contain uh, chemicals that can be harmful in the marine environment. And even nutrients are harmful in the marine environment and the freshwater environment when they're in, in too high of concentrations, as well as uh, human and animal wastes, uh, hazardous spills and releases. Everybody remembers the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And then there's also in statute, there's what's called a public nuisance. And that's one of the, uh, the, the references here uh, applies to derelict vessels. So the, uh, what is in, in the Florida statutes, uh, the chapter that deals with crime. That's where this, this uh, reference lives. And then there's also the registration, documentation, and titling of vessels. Uh, federal rules apply to documented vessels, but Florida statutes in Chapter 320, 328 uh, also applies and requires uh, vessels to be properly titled, registered, so that when we have an issue with a vessel, we know who the rightful owner and the responsible party are. Uh, riparian rights, uh, these are the, the rights that are, are granted to uh, people that own or, or lease waterfront property. They can lease sovereignty submerged lands uh, by the statutory references there. Excuse me, there. Sinking and sunken vessels, these are found in, in not only the uh, derelict vessel statutes, but other, other areas. And they most, I think they most um, importantly apply to uh, the derelict vessel statute. Uh, solutions, again, what are our existing rules and what, um, what potential new rules do, do, we, uh, do we need to, to look at and, and propose? And this, this, this other uh, note is a personal note of mine, and this is my opinion, that our most effective way to enforce and, and implement solutions are as close as we can get to the root cause. Oftentimes, we can't get to the root cause of, of problems because of private property rights or the right to to utilize certain certain things that in our society but it's when these these um, when these objects and and chemical constituents enter our waterways and harm our waterways that's why we that's when we as um, the, the the public uh, become interested in making sure that our, our waterways provide us all the, the benefits that we talked about earlier. Um, <clears throat> and then stored vessels. I did find a reference to long-term stored vessels in Chapter 327 of Florida Statutes. Um, this is a question that perhaps um, Phil Horning can answer for us, um, but it's, I, I 
I found it, and I'm, I'm not sure if the study that's referenced there has commenced or, or, or its status. And then the final, um, the final item on my outline is the Vessel Turn-In Program. And this is a relatively new program that the Florida Legislature enacted in statute and then tasks the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission with implementation. And you may have, you may have noticed that I probably should have mentioned it earlier, that I deliberately... Uh, organized these items for discussion along alphabet, alf, the alphabet. So by putting them in alphabetic order, I did not uh, try to influence the uh, importance or, or try to diminish any the importance of any item on there. I simply put them all in, in alphabetic order so that we could um, uh, look at these, determine whether or not uh, this list is is complete, whether or not we need to add anything to this. Um, I might, uh, I might want to have a, a discussion if anybody wanted to take something off, but um, certainly want to make sure that we've captured what I intended to be a comprehensive list. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, give the, uh, the, the floor back to you. Looks like a good job well done there, Robert. I mean, there's a lot of information here, and I love the references that allow us to go back and <clears throat> cross-check the uh, statutes. Um, at this time, I think I might like to open the floor to uh, uh, the FWC representative or um, Mr. Kirschenfeld, perhaps, if anybody from the county wants to embellish uh, what Robert had to say. Or from there, we'll move on to the committee. I'm sure the committee has a number of questions. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? I just want to say thank you, Robert. It seems like after years, all of a sudden, here we have all the statutes. I know that there's probably people in the audience. Last committee meeting, we had, you know, we're coming, having people come consistently now. Um, on the derelict vessel question, and <laughs> I mean, it's just such a conundrum, and people are getting very um, impatient about our ability to do anything with it. So, Robert, where is this online so that the people that aren't here um, might be able to find it? Because this is such a useful resource to point people to so they can start to understand how the county is, you know, the limitations and, and the, the other areas that we, where we can explore to try to help better than we are. As of tonight, they are going to be, they're part of the public record. So, um, and, and as recently as this afternoon, I was, I was tweaking these and, and adding to them after discussing with, with individuals. So this will be online as part of your minutes and will be a document that I really considered this um, to be uh, in, in outline form so that the public, the Marine Advisory Committee, um, my boss and, and the uh, regulatory agencies could provide their input. I think a lot of this will probably need the county attorney to, uh, to review some of these statutory references and, um, and, and make a determination of what we uh, can and, and or what would be an appropriate and, and legal interpretation of these and how we may, as the Board of County Commissioners directs, would... Uh, uh, move forward with any of these items. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, Robert, again, well well presented. And uh, I would certainly agree that, uh, you know, further study into this is warranted. I would ask us if we could address, uh, obviously, the derelict vessel. Anything that, the, the debris, the derelict vessels in the waterways is going to be one of the major concerns. And I wouldn't dare point the fingers at just the FWC. I would ask where does our own county sheriff's department enforcement program fit into that? And I would guess we would need more legal understanding of what our expectations are from our own county folks before we point fingers at some other agency, you know, and say, why aren't they doing enough? I think, I think everybody's trying to do what they can do, you know, doing a good job with the people you have. But, you know, if we need to try to, to push some, some allocation of resources into a different area, maybe that's what we need to try to get an idea on. So, it would be nice to know where our own county, you know, law enforcement 
would would reside responsibility wise for enforcing some of this derelict vessel program. It can't all be FWC responsibility. And I would I would defer to my boss and to um, uh, those above me in the chain of command to uh, to provide any kinds of, of communications at the level of the sheriff or the level of our our representatives that control the the state budgets. But um, I think that's a that's a good point that you know we've we've talked about the the, the critical role of enforcement and then and and what the critical role of funding is for enforcement. Captain Clark, do you have anything that you you'd like to add to that right now, or would you like to make any comments, or you want to wait and? Yeah, if you would, please come to the to the podium, and then we'll ask uh, Phil Horning uh, if he wants to. Uh, Good afternoon. Thanks for having me again. I think this is an important board. You made some important decisions for the concern of the folks behind us and the people that are listening. They have a voice and they want to be heard. And it's important that we hear what they have to say yeah. and see what we can do to resolve these issues. Yeah. So very important board. I appreciate what you're doing. I like just to add, Robert did a tremendous job in presenting all the statutes that the legislators have created, you know, through the voices of the people behind me. They're hearing the concerns. They know that derelict vessels, at-risk vessels, are a very hot topic, not just in Escambia County, but all 67 counties in our state. FWC, we're hearing the voices of concern with derelict boats and at-risk boats. And we also push the legislators in helping develop, you know, what makes it a derelict vessel. What are the steps that makes it a derelict vessel? So it's very, very important to us as well. You have a great point. You know, I have nine officers and we have three shifts, and at best you may have two on a shift. A shift can be last eight, 10 to 12 hours, or it can be beyond that. Um, so anything that you create on a ordinance side of it, you really need to look at your ability to enforce it from the county side. We as a state agency, we're gonna focus on state statutes that we see on, on the PowerPoint that Robert presents, but on county ordinances, it really needs to be revealed and and see how they can regulate and police that. Um, Robert's correct. There are two locations on the anchoring limitations in Jacksonville and Broward. I don't know. I don't know how successful they are, but I knew. I do know Broward has a very large marine presence. Um, probably seven boats, or not even more, and they're 365 days out of the years when they patrol. Um, that's kind of what my input was on the enforcement aspect aspect of it and the important part of the legislature understanding the importance of derrick boats um, any questions for me yes sir yeah um captain clark I, in fact I, I intended to get robert to go through the local process first but uh, could you walk through someone at a county uh, local county government says we think we have a, a derelict or an at-risk vessel here and could you just step through the process for FWC to uh, what do you do next? How do you make that determination? And then uh, how do you uh, work through, if, you do, if it's part of your role, to say, yes, this needs state funding, or how do you approve the funding to remove the, such, such a, a vessel or debris? All right, so I have more than three minutes? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, Sorry about that. No, that's okay. As I said before, you know, FWC got with our legislators and we created, you know, definition what creates a derelict vessel. That's actually in statute. Mm -hmm. We either have it wrecked or junk or substantially dismantled. And what does that mean, you know, and that's in statute as well. You know, a wrecked boat would be something that's high and dry. It's, it's so, it can't get off on its own propulsion. Mm -hmm. That alone makes it a derelict. Okay. Um, so same to dismantle would mean that it doesn't have either a propulsion, steerage, or any kind of um, compromised hull. If two of those three elements exist, that makes it a derelict. If not, then it's at risk. There are stages at, ri at risk that we cite from the first violation, the second, and the third, and it continues to go in increments of amount of fines and, and can increase. So. Typically, we encourage our officers to not have the blindfold on, determine 
at risk first, because that's the most important part. We don't want it to become derelict. That's why we have a statute for at risk to address these issues early. So it doesn't become an environmental issue. It doesn't sink and impede navigation. So um, that's why that statute is there. So we try to do that. Um, then you can identify the owner of the boat. And that can be great. That can be very difficult. In the state of Florida, in order to sell a boat in state, a title has to be involved. So the exchange of information is there. The buyer and the seller have to go to DHSMV and say that I have sold the boat. And then the owner goes, I'm now the owner of the boat. And a lot of times that does not happen. So trying to identify the DV owner is very difficult and in itself can be a lengthy process. So let's just say we have a derelict boat. It meets the statute, what makes it a derelict. We identify the owner of it. Now we've got to give him notification. And that can either be not, 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 because it's a local address, or we've got to mail what we call a notice of right package. And basically it tells him how that his boat is derelict, and here's the steps to appeal it if you don't think it's derelict. And here's the outcome after 21 days. It can be removed by the state or by the county. So now we have to do that by restricted <laughs> delivery. So the person that we're sending the letter to must be the one who receives it and signs for it and acknowledges that he received his rights. Um, and that takes a long time. Let me tell you about the post office. A restricted delivery, they'll attempt to do it two times, and on the third time, it will be sent back. But it can take four to five months before we finally get a return receipt that it was not deliverable. If it is signed by it, it'd be quicker to get back to it. So that takes it beyond 21 days. So let's just say that um, we sent a letter, and the 21 days are up, and we didn't get no reply back. We know the letter was sent, we have it certified, then we have to wait another 20 days to then proceed on the administrative side of uh, removing the boat. Um, the county can reach out to the state of Florida, and that's one way of getting grant money to be used to remove the boat. But now even the state, FWC, has given, well, Phil can probably tell you, I think it's over $20 million. That's how important the legislators see this as an issue that we have a pool of money that we can use our contractors and then we can pull it ourselves. So either the county or the state can act on that. And that's the basis of a process of a derelict vessel. You gotta photograph it, you gotta write a uh, pretty long incident report describing what makes it derelict. And then we gotta go before the court because we write the guy a citation. Uh, and then we gotta defend it while we deemed it being derelict. So it's. It's a long, lengthy process. It's not quick, and I, I get it. You know, you have a boat that's completely sunk and it's blocking the navigation in Bayou Chico. Um, sometimes we can declare it as an immediate type of removal, but even then, you have to store it somewhere until that entire administrative process is going through. Hmm. There are steps that we can do to speed it up, but um, that's the lengthy process. And I'm, I know Phil can probably add way more than what I just described. Mr. Chair, can I ask a follow-up yes, on, on Glenn's question? Thanks for being here. You probably get so tired of repeating all the same stuff over and over, but it is a lot of bureaucratic stuff that you guys are functioning under that I think the com community members are trying to wrap their arms around so that they can figure out how we can help them. And um, I was hoping that you could kind of underline to your mind, per the statutes, what are the absolute, what's the basic minimum criteria, just so everybody can hear it again, on what actually makes a vessel derelict? You know, um, what can make a vessel derelict? One, if it's wrecked. And wrecked means if it is beached. So let's say you take it and, and the sailboat guy rammed it into a shallow ground. He rammed it in there. Now he can't get it removed. He's going to have some kind of mechanical device, sea tow, tow boat U.S., to come and yank it off. So if it doesn't move on its own and he can't get it off on his own, that alone is a derelict. It is also a derelict when the boat is um, substantially dismantled, meaning that it doesn't have a steerage, doesn't have a kind of a rudder, it doesn't have propulsion, either like a motor or a cell, or the hull itself is compromised, meaning that it is is taken on water and it can sink. So um, those are three criteria. A junk boat would be something that is totally stripped. 
you can have an empty hull boat that everything of any value has been removed off of it. That itself can be is derelict. And then boats that are uh, tied to private docks, boats that are tied to governmental docks, and the owner of that dock or that property did not give that boat owner consent to be there, or he withdraws that consent, that is also to declare a derelict boat. Thank you. Super helpful. Just one quick, um, just to really kind of drill down on this. Dinghies, canoes, mm -hmm. rowboats, uh, so, you know, things that aren't motorized, aren't sailboats, um, run down, but not, you know, not, um, not wrecked, um, not taking on water, um, whether or whether they have not been seen to um, be perhaps violating some law with dumping. So you've just got a dinghy or some small vessel that is anchored out in the state waters off the shoreline and perhaps somebody's sleeping in it. Perhaps people are seen coming and going from that. Is that a derelict vessel? And if not, that it's in compliance, correct? There, there is be. no ordinance that any that I'm aware of on what Robert has given here, public nuisance aside, which is always a gray area, but in terms of what, what you're speaking about with the criteria for what you can do in order to take a boat away from somebody or, you know, get it out of there, that, that does not qualify. Is that, and, and, and I'm saying this because there are a couple of these vessels in, you know, the Navy Point area, but I know they're everywhere in Escambia County, and these are the ones that really attract attention. And people get so upset. Well, there's a guy that's sleeping on this boat off the shoreline. Why can't anybody do anything about it? What, it, it can, any thoughts that you have on that would be so helpful. Yeah, anchor boats have to display uh, during, after sunset, have to display all around white light. So there's, they're still required to do that. The reason behind it, and it makes sense to you because boaters can see it and avoid it and not hit it. Boats like that cannot anchor in the channel um, that would impede or become an optical of concern, so they can't anchor there. Uh, you're right. Uh, tenders, small boats like that, um, that, that is not motorized, does not require a registration. Um, certain links require a title, but not a registration. So um, if a boat is, is just floating, unattended, and it's just out there, then that's considered abandoned or lost, and then that can be uh, retrieved, taken to land, and then posted that, you know, a, a boat was found. And then um, if no takers, then it can be destroyed. That's such an important point that, I mean, it sounds obvious enough now that you've said it, but I don't know if that it's ever been said here. If a boat's not registered, if a boat doesn't require to be registered, then... It's, it's tough to find the owner. It, typically, a boat will have a hen number. So, um, and typically if you run it, sometimes you can get information on the owner, but just think about that. You know, if you, if you go to a Walmart or you buy it from John Doe, you know, um, you may not ultimately find the responsible person or the boat owner of that. That is true. I certainly don't want to leave anybody in the audience with the idea that I'm trying to make some excuses for why these things can't be taken care of um, because we're going to increasingly probably see a problem with people who don't have anywhere else to live, um, but on their boats, and this is increasingly clear that this is going to be an issue that we're gonna have to find various ways of um, grappling with. So thank you, Captain Yeah, Clark. like liver boards, uh, they use those small boats to get to shore and then they take it back. So, it, and they can just beach it right there and, and do what they need to do. Uh, they do something on land and that's when they use it to get back. But they still have to comply with navigational, uh, boating safety, navigational lights, and anchoring. So they're still required to do that. Captain Clark, one, one quick question for me, um, and then I think we have some questions from some folks in the audience. Um, Robert had uh, referenced uh, a state statute uh, regarding uh, vessel registration. And he, he uh, it's not on our sheet, but he said it was Florida 328. Are you... Do you know if that's the statute that we're referring to? I'll ask him. I know it's, uh, um, 
You know, I used to write uh, uh, citations, so they would come to the top of my head easy. Registration, expired registrations were 320, I think 327.73, I think, is what we would cite. Where, where, where you get that? <laughs> uh, it should be right here, right? Under vessel registration documentation? Yeah. yeah. If we'll add that, uh, it's Florida Statute 328, right? Yep. Okay. Well, and three, there, are there, there are references, and then there are standards. So the references, Captain Clark is exactly right. There are <coughs> references in Chapter 327. But if you look at the, the, the section in Florida Statutes on vessels, vessel safety is 327 as well as titles and liens are, are in and 328. 328. So, yeah. so one of the difficulties that, that, that we have enforcing these things is that people don't always register. But there is a law in Florida, and would you mind reminding us of what the law states regarding, I know if I buy a car, I got 30 days to go register. So would you mind remind us of the laws both that are, regarding yeah, uh, that are power over 9.9 .9 are required to be even electric, Trolling motor, anything that's being used to power a boat, it could be a small dinghy, nine feet long, and they're powering it requires a registration. Non-motorized boats like kayaks and uh, canoes, etc., are not. Even a racing school, believe it or not, is not required. Um, they're not required to have a life jacket, believe it or not, but they're not required to be registered. Mm. So motorized boats, to generalize, motorized boats, even if it's electric has to be registered to be used, has to display a Florida registration, has to have all the safety equipment like any motorboat has to have. The, the yeah. time frame to register your new vessel? You have 30 days. So let's 30 say days. you buy a boat, your bill of sale is good for 30, they'll act as your registration for 30 days. On the 31st day, if it's on the waters of the state, it has to be registered. And then it, you have to re-register again every, every year. And they could get a fine on day 31? You can. Okay. Yes, sir. Great, great. Sir, we have a question um, in the audience. Uh, should uh, can you come on up and uh, state your name and address for us, please? I can, I can be loud. I used to be a lifeguard. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sergeant. Okay. Sergeant Clark. Okay, and this is for Officer Clark. You just said any any vessel that's continuously on the water for thirty days, which would apply to a kayak or a dinghy, correct, has to be registered within the state of Florida. Um, you're talking about registration? Yes. Yeah, it's motorized. Powered vessel. No, a it has to be a vessel. powered vessel. Yes. Because I thought that, like a documented vessel, even if it's on state waters for 30 days. You're thinking about a title. Yes, every on the 90th, on the 91st day, let's say you have a boat that's transient through Florida. Sure. And if they're in our state waters for over 90 days, okay. technically they have to title in the state because you got to think they're using the waters of the state of Florida. Okay. And, um, just like every other. You know, but does that apply to motorized, or would that apply to her kayaks and canoes? That would apply for um, yes, it would apply for all tidal vessels. Oh, tidal. Okay. Registration. Okay. Two okay. Please, for the record, would you state your name and address, sure. please? Thank you. Uh, Ted German, dock master at Seagrass Marinas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No. One more question for yes, the sir. Captain, Captain Clark. Captain, one more question, please. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, is there any chance that your officers, I know when you're out there and you're, and you're enforcing state statutes, and I know we're talking about the county officers doing the county statutes and such, do you have reciprocity? I'm not sure if that's the right word, but I know I've been out with Ferris and the guys before, and they've been able to enforce federal violations. Are you able to enforce or cite county violations, and can our county guys cite state violations? Or do they just look at it and say, oh, that's not me, you know, and just drive off? Is there any way that, that we all work together for the for the end game, the, you know, the betterment of our waterways? Or do, do they just look the other way? If no, it's I not? wouldn't close the door on that. You could have a, a memorandum of understanding in terms of empowering FWC officers to enforce county ordinances. It's been done. We generally do not. Uh, but that is a possibility, yes. All law enforcement officers, that's the city, deputies, FDLE, uh, DOT, FHP, all are empowered to for Florida statutes. Okay. It's not solely on us. Uh, so so, they're, they're so a county certainly wouldn't say, ah, oh, that state, I'm, I'm not worried about that, that state. They're already empowered to, 
to enforce state a, mem a memorandum of understanding between state to do county yeah we're we as an agency at fwc we do voting accidents yes sir. and the sheriff go we're going to take this one yes he can call that shot and he can take a voting act but generally speaking we we do voting acts yeah, yes sir Very familiar everything with else well you probably resource will be fwc um but anything else yes um, okay. other county um law enforcement they do enforce florida statutes yes sir mm -hmm. thank you captain mm -hmm. no problem and Phil may want to add anything that I just Robert's said. in the back. Robert's actually in the back room with him on the phone he? so he can hear hear us okay. better. He He's right there. Hang on, Phil. Let me, uh, let me put you on speaker and see if, if we can hear you. Go ahead, Phil. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so like Captain Clark was saying, uh, you know, my, my purview, my, my area of specialty, so that that power to enforce 2311 is given to FWC and all law enforcement officers in the state that are uh, certified in Florida. So uh, a municipal officer, a county deputy, or a state law enforcement officer can enforce uh, under 823. Thanks, Phil. Sounds like one more reason we have mentioned it before when folks come in here and they they have uh, derelict vessel to to report and want to know you know what the process is. We keep saying to 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 weigh in with the county and the city over and over. And the more that they hear from us, the the county has a marine unit. Uh, the city used to have a marine unit. They don't at this time that I'm aware of. But uh, if we keep pinging on them, you know, uh, these, you know, the, the state law enforcement officers, they need help. And, um, you know, the, they, don't, they don't have the resources to, to hit all these guys. You know, we've talked to them about putting dye packs in the, in the holds of these boats so they're not flushing their toilet in the bayou, you know, and they, and they just can't get around to all of them. So, you know, again... Uh, the, 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 the Sheriff's Department has the authority to enforce these uh, ordinances. Um, we just need to get a little more help. So, uh, does anybody have any other questions uh, regarding these? Yes, sir. Please come forward and state your name and address. Excuse me, I was carrying some boats. No. <laughs> My name's Raymond Canterbury. I live at 324 East Sunset, right on Davenport Bayou. My question is, and to my understanding, if a boat was equipped with a motor, but it's no longer have a motor, and if it had sails that no longer has sails, there's no way propulsion except for we have one that uses a rope to go back and forth. And it doesn't have a light on it, it's a sailboat, and there are people living on it. And we see them dumping stuff over every day. I don't know what they're dumping over, but we need it checked out, if there's any way. Especially since it has no light. It may have new registrations, we don't know. At one time it didn't. And that is in Devonport Bayou. And it's tied up, not to the county, but to some rocks by the county. And he uses a rope yes. that goes through his rails and stuff. And he's got it anchored out so he can pull the boat back and forth. When he wants to get out, he pulls it back towards the county. When he wants to go back out, he just pulls it out. So hmm. how would you... Uh, Say it's not in propulsion, don't have its own uh, motor, because I have no sails. It has no steering. So that's a good question. I hope get some kind of answer on it. Thank you so much for that. That's so helpful, because that's exactly the sort of thing that I was trying to, to, to get uh, at. And so with, with who Robert's got on the line or Captain Clark, I would love to know specifically 
with this example that you're talking about, what possible statutes are in violation in that? Because this, it's this type of thing that people are upset about over, it's, it's, you know, there are various ways, it changes up a little bit, but it's that type of thing that I was getting at, so I appreciate you offering that example. I understand from a different meeting we was in, the individual on the boat's got several citations against him, he's been arrested, and reports of being a child of molester, and he had a bottle pop. So we got a lot of concerns with this particular boat owner, or boat, the person living on the boat. I think, uh, is Mr. Horning? Uh, yeah, Mr. Addresses? Horning is going to uh, provide his, his comments as soon as I get my- the derelict vessel removal program? Yes. So hang on just a second. I'll get Phil to the uh, to the microphone. I'm going to try to take it off speaker. So hopefully that uh, it'll it'll come out a little better. Hang on here, Phil. One second. Thanks. Okay, go ahead. So I just wanted to comment on the uh, sailboat with a rope. Uh, basically, what you have there are three violations. You've got a potential violation for marine sanitation that has its own enforcement. And then you have uh, the propulsion, which you were saying the vessel does not have an effective means of propulsion for safe navigation because it has no sail and no motor. So in that particular case, uh, the officer can order the owner of the vessel to perform a evaluation to see if the vessel does have an effective means of propulsion for safe navigation. And if during that evaluation it is found the vessel does not, then it becomes an at-risk vessel and the owner can be cited. They are escalating fines. The first citation for the same offense is $100. Then it goes to $250 30 days after that. And then it goes to $500 after that. So there are uh, enforcement measures that can be taken for not having an effective means of propulsion for safe navigation. And then the third violation <clears throat> you were talking about is um, uh, believe no anchor light. And that also is its own enforcement. We can cite for not having an effective anchor light at night. So it, each one of those is a separate uh, offense and each one can be enforced separately. The big one is the lack of propulsion, and that's our at risk program. And what that is one of the elements found in 327.4107. A vessel that does not have an effective means of propulsion for safe navigation is considered at risk. And after the owner uh, takes the evaluation and fails it, then they can be issued a citation, and the vessel automatically becomes what's called a liveaboard vessel and it is defined as such and that also uh, starts off any local ordinances or regulations for the enforcement of liveaboard vessels in that area as well as all uh, state vessel law so um, i just wanted to kind of speak to that and and go from there are oars um, considered a method of propulsion in a small bayou? Phil, I don't know if you heard the question, but the question was, would oars be considered a, uh, an effective means of propulsion? Um, and as I recall that test, you have to, you have to make a certain distance and uh, a certain, in a certain time, you have to do an out and back course, if I remember correctly, but can you clarify whether or not in this case, the guy could produce a set of oars and oar locks and say, here's my propulsion? And we're talking about a sailboat? Yes, sir. It's so, about a 26-foot boat. Yeah. Uh, I, I would venture to guess that they could not pass the evaluation. Um, what they have to do is, for a sailboat only, they have to use the wind with their sail, or they have to use an auxiliary motor. So if the vessel has neither a motor or a... Um, or a sail, then it doesn't have the equipped propulsion that the vessel came with. 
Now, if the owner of the vessel wants to say, well, I am a human-powered vessel, then he can perform that evaluate, and he has 15 minutes to row that vessel for 100 yards in the direction of his choosing, I'm sorry, for a quarter mile in the direction of the officer's choosing, come about safely and return to the point of starting, which is another quarter mile. So he's got to row that thing a half a mile in 15 minutes, and he's not going to pass that evaluation. So therefore, the vessel would be cited for not having an effective means of propulsion for safe navigation. Thank you, Phil. I can't do that in a kayak. Lynn Mott, 509 North 12th Avenue. I just have a question. If you have a vessel that's a problem, who is the first person you contact? Is it FWC? Is it the sheriff? Or is it the police? I think that's the biggest problem people are having is they don't know where to go with it. So that's my question. I'll, gen I'll, I'll answer that one for myself. Whenever I observe uh, a, a vessel that, that, that I believe is uh, potentially in violation of any of the statutes, We'll, uh, we'll document it, we'll take pictures of it, and, um, and then I'll, I'll call Captain Clark and ask him to put it in the uh, rotation for, for his officers. Um, in the past, I would uh, send that to both Captain Clark and the, uh, Florida, the, the County Sheriff's Marine Unit, but as of um, in, the, in the fall, I know that the Sheriff's Marine Unit is not on the water. So once summertime comes and, and we, have, um, we have the Sheriff's Marine Unit hopefully on the water, then uh, generally I'll send it to both and ask them to respond back with whomever is going to take that so that we're not constantly uh, going to the same well over and over again. We're trying to... Um, within the, the statutory limitations, trying to get the, uh, the enforcement done uh, effectively, efficiently, within you know, a, a time period that would be responsive to the citizen request. Oh yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, just, uh, just one more that's kind of a peripheral, I think, question, and I don't know if this is a a uh, county issue or an FWC issue for Captain Clark. Um, I'm pretty familiar with this vessel that was described by Mr. Canaveri. Uh, it's a 25 foot Catalina swing hull, swing keel uh, boat in very shallow water. Um, 25 foot Catalinas don't have any kind of marine sanitation devices on them and it periodically has people living on it or staying on the vessel. So the question is, uh, in those situations where a vessel is probably, let's say, uh, doesn't have its own propulsion, has people living aboard it, and has no marine sanitation devices on it, is that any effect at all? Is there any consideration of th that condition um, in determining an at-risk or a derelict vessel, or is that a completely separate violation? Sorry, Captain Clark. <laughs> it would not make it a derelict or at risk, but they're required because of its length and because it has a berthing area, they're required to have a certified MSD. If it doesn't have a built-in MSD, then they have to have a portable, something that is designed to hold human waste and then, um, if not, then they can be cited for an infraction for that. Sorry, Robert, I'm not here. Phil, did you say you wanted to, to make a comment? No, I'm, I'm not here. Patient. Okay. You, you may want to, you may want to, uh, thank the, you. The question Captain was, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, can I speak to Mr. Canaveri real quick? Yes, sir. Ray, can you hear me, buddy? Yes, I can. Uh, is that that, very, that vessel you're referring to, is that right around the corner, right where your old house was on Sunset? That's correct. 
I'll get out there and have a look at it. It's been a long time since I've seen you. How you been doing, sir? Uh, doing good. Do you even remember me? Yes. Very good, sir. I'll try to catch you before we leave. It's been out here for over a year, and a lot of times it's just on the side. You know. I'll try to get a look at it myself, get, just to get a better understanding of what you're referring to. It looks like you got the information shared by the right fellow. So it's not really a permanent residence, more like a vacation home. Uh, <laughs> oh, is it? Right. The easiest way to see it is to just park at Civic Hand Park right there on the corner of Sunset and Second and just walk down the park. But though we're ready to live by the Any uh any other questions or comments? Yes, please come on up and uh let us know your name and address, please. Yes, sir. How you doing? Good evening. My name is Thomas Forney, 307 Edgewater Drive. And a uh, couple things, I'd like to hit about three topics. One, this gentleman before mentioned as far as the, the sewage that goes into the water. We all get upset about that, but as he pointed out, that's a drop in the bucket compared to a lot of the other stuff that goes in there. But that just demonstrates our frustration and you know, can only convey it certain ways. Uh, one big problem, I think, that really needs to be sorted out, in addition to, he had, Robert had mentioned, is that house that's down there across from the ore house. Uh, before you had people here that live in those apartments complaining, when we get a hurricane, that thing is going to move through, and it is going to wipe out those two marinas between that house and the bridge. And if I was the owner of either of those marinas, I'd have my attorneys already figuring out how they're going to sue the county for not taking care of it. So that's an issue that was in there. People built it and then new owners bought the uh, BioChico Marine or Chico Marine and kicked them out. So now it just sits over there anchored. It's got boats tied up to it. Our tourists come, they sit at the ore house, you look over at that thing, it is really just disgusting. But that's one issue. The other issue is, in Bayou Chico, our frustration is, these boats, there's no holding, and they drag up. The joke is, that's where you take your boat to die. It's a big parking lot, and imagine if they took uh, camper vans and pulled them up across the street from your homes, parked it on the other side, and then I find out, I've parked them there because I don't have property to put them on, but I can get $75 a month from some guy if he won't live in there. They live in there you have trouble backing out of your driveway. For those of you that may, if you don't live on the water, you're in a residential, I can legally park across the street from you. I can assure you that it wouldn't take long and people would be going to the county saying, you gotta have a law, you gotta do something. So it comes down to, you need more enforcement abilities. And Robert and the county marine folks do not have any authority. So we're asking you to help us, and we'll help you. Do we have to go to the county uh, commissioner's meetings? But somebody needs to give our county officers the authority to assist FWC and be able to go out there and do some of these things. I think that might be very helpful, but the county has to authorize that. Short of doing that, these boats set out there and they just drag up on our properties during the storms. So. Those are all our frustrations, but thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mayor, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wanted to ask how things went the other day if you took your tour with Mr. Day, so I'd, I'd love to hear if, if, if that happened or, oh, that you know. Was not, that was not me. Oh, I thought that that was you that was going to be going out with, with Mr. Day. No, that was not me. Okay. Just um, a couple of, um, couple of things I wanted to respond to you. Totally get your frustration, really. I'm, and, and I mean, some of us have, have been listening to these stories for years. I haven't been on the committee that long, but I've been coming to this, this, you know, coming to these meetings for that long. Um, I want to reiterate, it's, it, I think that it would help all of us, committee folks, residents alike, to be, try to really hone in on um, exactly what the issues are. Um, when, because when you, when you say we need to give the county officials, um, we've, got, we've got to give them the authority Sheriff's Department has the authority. That's what we keep hearing over and over. 
Now, there's also the question of whether you're, if you're asking that there be county ordinances drafted, that is certainly something that Robert has talked about for years, talking to the county attorney's uh, department, and whether we need to make that an objective on, on our committee to assist him to try to get county ordinances, which Captain Clark has already said they don't have the manpower to enforce, but we could, if, if we wanted to, have a memorandum of an understanding that might concretize some of that. Mm -hmm. um, frustration warranted again, but an analogy to me being so frustrated that I'm calling the police because people are parking across the street from my house. I invite people to park in front of my house all the time so they can use the park across the street from my house. Um, if it come up and they're a bunch of meth heads or they're making crime or they're doing something, you can bet I'm gonna be frustrated by that. The, complex, the complexity of this problem is there are so many issues going into this with so many different bureaucratic groups that we, we've got to all, as a community, while we're trying to solve this, stay specific. Like for instance, this gentleman mentions that he's got someone that they believe is on the sex offender rolls. That's something for the sheriff's department. That I don't even, I don't think that's something that, that FWC you know, enforces. So maybe what we do is we help Robert continue to build a compendium. First, we gotta have a reference of all of the different little pockets that this stuff is living in, right? So that we can have these conversations better about what the heck we do about it. Because I don't want people to lose track of the fact that the Sheriff's Department can enforce this. I also don't want them to blame the Sheriff's Department because they're awful busy scraping people off the streets these days. We've met with Alex Andrade. I've had him down here, our congressman, uh, to determine ownership and various things because these guys go and write tickets and put them on the boats and they blow away. They're gone. Uh, ownership is not determined by passing a piece of paper along. It has to be titled, as, as Mr. Clark had stated. Uh, but the one, going back to my reference enforcement, some more help, Robert can answer that question for you. He and I, we've had this discussion. He has, and the county, from my understanding, has no authority. They're busy. The sheriff's department is busy. We've met with uh, uh, the sheriff and his deputy, Hobbs, and he says, we'll get a boat out there anytime you need it and do all that. Everybody's willing to help, but all resources are thin. So I'm just asking that Robert could fill you in definitely on what would help Robert and the county, the Marine Division, what would help them help us? So Andy's told, Andy Hobbs has told you guys that he, they're willing to engage in this type of thing. It's oh. a matter of resources. Yes, right? well, that was last year. We had met with him. He came over and met with us with uh, uh, Alex Andrade there. And also we've met with him over at his office. And he says, you let me know, I'll send a boat out. So everybody's helpful, but they're all re restricted in their resources. And uh, Robert Turpin, he's out there every week. He can show you the pictures of all the boats and do all this. So uh, he'd be the one to be able to tell you if you asked him, how could we all or the county help him do the job? That Just want to say, I'm so sorry, because I, I, because I am an advocate and there is nothing that is more frustrating than going in a, in a round robin and having everybody hot potato you to the next right. thing. At the same time, there is so, it's so complex that you, I think you're hearing a lot, well, go to the commission, go to the sheriff's department, like come anywhere but here, and I guarantee you that is not what people mean. It's just how, hopefully we can keep working on how to bring a coalition together to, to solve this, because it's gonna take everybody pulling from the same end of the rope. And if you tell us what we need to do to help you to get to the county, we're all heirs. Thank you. Thank Sir, you. One, one other thing. How do you spell your name? F-O-R-N-E-Y. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Forney. So, am I uh, here yes. and all we need to do is give Robert a badge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a big stick. <laughs> Just a badge. <laughs>
your uh, name and address, please. Hello, I'm David McDonald from 333 Edgewater Drive, and I'm with the Bayou Chico Association, first time here in this meeting. Um, we are very interested in the water quality of the bayou. We're not a homeowners association. We're a group of folk, citizens who are paying close attention to the quality and the environment of the bayou. Love to partner with you on all this, right? And we'd like, we got a number of members here today and Tom was one and others are here today as well. So when the question is, how do we help you? How do you help us? How about we partner together and Robert, Chips, um, are already and go to, to most of our meetings. Uh, some city councilmen and members go to our meetings as well. And we do talk about water quality and we do talk about abandoned um, and derelict boats. Uh, we have a problem on the bayou, as everybody does. Love for us to think about the Pensacola area becoming a responsible boating area with affirmative enforcement, with visible engagement with people who anchor boats, and probably some legislative solutions. Came here today just to get to know you and, and volunteer to partner with you, and hopefully we can work together to address the water quality especially when we think about navigation, abandoned boats, and especially when we think about what they're dumping off the side of those boats. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir, thank you. <clears throat> I had, uh, yes, yes, sir, please come uh, on up. I'm sorry, uh, Trips. Come on uh, up, please. Hi, my name is Barry Johnson, 634 Lakewood Road, Pensacola, Florida. Um, to make sure that I don't ramble, I'd like to read off something that I wrote. And uh, I'm also a member of the Bio Chico Association. I'm the vice president. Uh, and this has to do, I, I know there's a lot of issues here, and Robert did a great job on the presentation. Uh, it, it's like spaghetti. Everything touches everything else when you start dealing with this, and, and I realize that. So I'm going to just make a statement about, mainly about the derelict vessels and, and our view on this, okay? Uh, the number one consideration when talking about regulating acreage areas is Whatever we do, uh, whatever we do, it should provide the least amount of restriction for responsible cruisers and boaters. The people of Pensacola should welcome responsible cruisers to our area. I would love to meet more of them and hear the adventure stories they have to tell. But we can't have that in Bayou Chico because the derelict vessels are taking up all of the anchorage space. There is nowhere for cruisers to stay and they don't come visit. They don't spend money and they don't tell the world what a wonderful place Pensacola is to experience. The responsible cruiser is coming to our area for a brief amount of time to explore, provision, repair, meet new people, attend events, and enjoy what Pensacola has to offer. They will be spending money at our facilities, stores, and restaurants. As cruisers traveling long distances, they come here with a functional vessel that is probably well cared for. It has an engine good ground tackle and functional MSD, along with its paperwork and insurance in order. All of these items are concerns for the stakeholders on the bayou. Of these items, a good engine simply means that the boat can, can and has been moving to new places. Many of the derelict vessels on the bayou don't have a functional engine and couldn't leave if they wanted to. Good ground tackle means that the a properly sized anchor and rode in good condition that in the event of a storm, their owners are actively defending their vessels from dragging, dragging and damage. Many of the derelict vessels don't have an adequate anchor, nor do they have anyone actively keeping up with the vessel. So when the storm hits, that tiny anchor or rotted line just allows the derelict vessel to drag over onto another vessel or someone else's personal dock, causing damage to that, that the unknown owner does not have the resources or the insurance to take care of. A functioning MSD means having a working toilet on board with adequate holding tank or composting of capabilities. Without the working to toilet, derelict liveaboards can't hold it forever, so they must be pumping their waste directly into our waters. And remember, when they don't have an engine, they don't even have an engine to take their vessel to the pump out dock. Proper paperwork and registra registration means that we know who owns and is responsible for each vessel. Many of the derelict and unregistered vessels have people living on them, but they don't really claim ownership until someone tries to get rid of the vessel. You would never find the derelict vessel's owner if something really went wrong. It's not mine. 
and having insurance to protect not only yourself but others that your vessel may cause, cause damage to. And primarily the insurance just is to protect our lifestyle in the event of a claim so that we can recover our asset or protect other assets. The derelict vessel owners probably have nothing to lose and therefore don't care if you sue them for damages that their unattended vessel may cause, much less the environmental impact left behind in the form of human waste, engine oils, and gasoline or diesel fuels leaked out at the time of sinking. I'm tired of their oil drifting up into my backyard and then I have to clean it up. We all pay the price for that damage and then have to pay again to have the vessel salvaged and then destroyed. What a waste of these resources. I'm almost done. It is my personal opinion that somewhere between 45 to 90 days should be long enough for a vessel to anchor, explore, and then move on to their next adventure. If you wish to live long term on your vessel, then it should be maybe at a marina that has facilities in place to take care of your needs, as in pump outs and showers. Marinas also have attendants to help keep an eye on your possibly unattended vessel and let you know if it's sinking. As for cruisers, anchoring out, no car parking is needed, just somewhere safe and secure to leave their dinghy while they go explore the town on their folding bicycle. Please remember, during your review of these issues, the stakeholders along Bayou Chico don't mind seeing the vessels of responsible owners anchored out in the bayou. Responsible boaters anchor well and anchor outside of navigational channels. Most are friendly and courteous. Their beautiful vessels add to the maritime background experienced by tourists in our fair city. They add to our economy and they will be gone soon, leaving room for another possible friendship to anchor in their place. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, very nice. Uh, Mr. Curtis Felt, please. Thank you. I'm Chip Kirschenfeld, Director of Natural Resources with Escambia County. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of you for your uh, time and your, your volunteering to, to serve on the, the committee. Um, I, I did want to uh, bring your attention to an effort that uh, Robert Turpin and I had last year. Um, we worked with uh, the Florida Association with Counties and also the state legislature to try to get some changes to the wording in uh, Florida Statute 32770, which deals with enforcement. Um, we've, we've heard tonight that, uh, you know, there, there are two, two agencies that have the authority uh, for enforcement, but they have limited resources and limited personnel, uh, and that's the Sheriff's Department and, and FWC. Um, the county, on the other hand, has resources and has personnel in the, uh, in the code enforcement officers that we have with the county uh, and also the staff with the Marine Resources Division, uh, but we don't have the authority. Uh, so our attempt last year uh, was to try to change the, the wording through the Florida legislature with uh, Florida Statute 32770 that talks about who has the state's authority to enforce uh, all of these uh, state statutes. And, and of course, it, it says there on page six in your handout uh, with what Robert put together, that it has to be a sworn law enforcement officer or FWC law enforcement, county sheriff, or municipal police. It's very, very clear in the state statute who has that enforcement authority. So what we try to do is uh, get the Florida legislature to add county code enforcement officers to that list of personnel uh, that can enforce these state statutes. Um, we, we were not successful uh, with that effort. But uh, that is something uh, that I think we should continue to pursue with uh, Representative Andrade's office. Uh, and also um, with the Florida Association of Counties, because there are other counties that are in the same situation uh, that we are, uh, that have the resources and have the code enforcement officers that could do this enforcement, but they just do not have the state authority. Uh, so uh, I, I would just uh, propose that as uh, something that we could all 
uh, get behind uh, with our state legislators uh, and try to get that wording changed. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Mr. Kirsten Chips, good to see you, sir. So what is the hang up? I mean, if, if code enforcement can operate freely on land, what's what's the defining reason of why they say we can't give them any authority on water? If it's in the county or municipal right of way. But because our county code enforcement officers are not sworn law enforcement officers. But they don't have to be to do enforcement on land. Why yeah. do they have to be on water? Exactly. I guess that's why and, and that was the uh, the argument that we presented to the Florida Association of Counties and yes, the sir. legislature was that these code enforcement officers, they're trained to, uh, to cite properties uh, in the terrestrial environment on yes. land. Yes, uh, and they are trained to track down the owners of those properties. Yes, very, very similar functions that would be required here yeah. uh, in the marine environment. To human action, they're brutal. They do a good job. So a, a county ordinance can't trump a state ordinance. Says so you can't. We can't. The county can't make an ordinance that says our code enforcement can issue enforcement on county right of ways. Our, our county uh, in, uh, code enforcement officers cannot enforce state statutes. Can, we, can they enforce a county statute on the water? Uh, that, that's a good question, uh, and I'll uh, ask our county attorney that. If uh, Scamby County came up with an ordinance uh, that dealt with many of these issues, uh, could that ordinance then... Uh, uh, empower our code enforcement officers to enforce that. Um, my guess is uh, that the answer would be that's going to conflict with state statutes. Okay. Yeah, Clint, it's not a great time for home rule. So, well, I mean, just, so I, mean, I, I no, you know, and I, and I mean no trouble. I'm just trying to no, no, any no, no. solution yeah. we can find. No, I, 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 that was yeah. partly in jest, but partly serious. It's a really horrible time for home rule yeah. in the state of Florida. So I, it, you know, try as you might. It's even tougher these days to wrest any control out of the state. But I mean, Chip's fact starts tomorrow. Is well, there any thought at all of, I mean, is it kind of dead right now? Or is there anyone that's going to be carrying that message, um, that dead letter? Yeah, you know, <laughs> after, we, after we got shot down last year, right. there, there is not an effort. But uh, that's not to say that, that it couldn't be reinvigorated. Thank you. Th thank, thank, you sir. thank you again for your service. Yes, sir, thank you. Good point. Maybe if we offered to levy big fines and hand them over to the state when we were done doing it, they'd be more amenable. Please come up to the uh, microphone <coughs> so we can get it all on tape. <coughs> Name and address. I'm Frank Petty Jr. Petty Marine Enterprises in Pensacola. I live on the west side, on the county side. I have a business. Um, been almost 40 years on the water. I uh, raised my family, my grandchildren. We all live together right there on Bayou Chico. I grew up on Bayou Chico. I've seen it change for the better. A slow change, slow progress, but it's been progress. Now I see quite an abuse from derelict vessels. And when I first built my home there, and uh, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, there were no boats that anchored out there. So here comes Ivan. We had nine boats in our backyard, boats all over the shipyard, and the process started. They started anchoring out there. No place, no docks. We understand that. But then they knew they could abuse it. And they haven't left. It's just been other boats. I was on the phone with Robert one time, and I was telling him, I said, there's a boat sinking out there. He says, yeah, Frank, I know about the boat. I said, hold on just a minute. 
they're towing another boat as we speak right now. Towing a boat out there, anchored not too far from it, didn't sink too long after that. They're just towing boats out there, letting them go. I'm telling you, if you're trying to find a legitimate owner, you're not going to find one. And then when it ends up on our beach, taxpayers' beach, you know what happens? They have to sit there 60 days. you got to find an owner for 60 days on your beach when your grandchildren are going to get injured or hurt on these derelict vessels or whatever floats up from the bayou. It is frustrating. And, I, you know, I run a business, too, you know. And I love Bayou Chico. I think it's a great waterway. And I appreciate the other people that come and more in Bayou Chico. But the problem is with these derelict vessels, it is pushing everything further out. Now, I have submerged land leased myself. Now, I've been, I've been leasing from the state for many years. And I have a big basin and a 700-foot channel, my own channel, that we work with the Corps of Engineers to line up with the core channel that comes up to uh, uh, Paddy's Rail. Now, they're anchoring all over it. Now, I've called the state before when I had a guy anchor on a submerged land that we pay lease on. And he said, you know, you don't own the bottom. I said, no, I don't own the bottom. The state owns the bottom, but I lease from the bottom, and your hook is in my bottom. I had to get somebody to go out there and have them move, and he just moved over. That's fine. Because, you know, we have to, when we pay for that bottom, we need that waterway to get the vessels, you know, to navigable water. So we build big vessels. They draw a little bit of water, and we need that. The biggest concern is the abuse. There's, it's time to do something because the abuse is terrible. Like you say, the derelict vessels are just piling up out there. And the good-natured, good boat owner that comes out there and wants to anchor up a Bayou Chico, because it is a beautiful Bayou Chico. It's beautiful. They are they're outnumbered by the derelict vessels. And now they're encroaching in navigable waterways. I mean, where it's a hazard. Well, I don't know how, anybody, how anybody gets it to the northern branch or the western branch, you know. And it's going to be all the way across before long, before we, I know this is a good thing that everybody's trying to address now. And now it's got to the point where something has to be done. Something has to be done. And, you know, when I had the boat yard and I would take boats and I would do it for free to help get the uh, derelict vessels out of the water. I said, I said, I'll pop, you know, I'm still the crane operator. I said, I'll put the hook on it, and now you bring it to me, I'll get it out of the water, and y'all take it to the uh, uh, landfill. I don't have a problem doing that because we all appreciate Bayou Chico. It's a mixed-use bayou, the only one we have. And it's the only one that really has a mooring field for transit people. They come in, like you say, uh, uh, transiting the, the Gulf or, or you know, uh, uh, the our beautiful natural resources that, you know, uh, they like to enjoy, just like we do. But it's getting abused. And it's getting to a point now where we can't do business. It's a hazard to uh, our, our, you know, our, our families that we uh, uh, have on, you know, that live on the water. And uh, we enjoy it. But if you see the same boat sink again and again, it's not getting done. Right. And it's not the point fingers at any agency, but we pay our taxes. We need results. We just could use some help. So everybody is in agreement with that. So I don't know what we can do. I know that Chip made a good point, you know, uh, about the county ordinance. And of course, you know, I've called all the agencies, you know, and they do have a problem with funding. I understand that. But you know, uh, just because you own a business living in a you can't take the law in your own hands. It's, <laughs> it's the other part. Like that guy that has that rope <laughs> going across. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if it was me, I, I'd, get, I'd, be, I'd lose that rope. It'd be gone. He'd figure some way out to get, to get to the beach. scissors. Excuse my language. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bishop Patty. Frank, thank you so much for coming because, honest to God, you can't get this done. Frank Patty cannot get movement on this. Frank Patty's just so, here <laughs> just to address it. So, just like I, I'm no better than any, any of these people right here, but we make our living on the bayou. Well, that's we what I'm saying, though, with on the your bayou. history and yeah. your business and you, the rights that you have and your own, like everything that you've laid out, at least parts. now 
we can start from scratch with saying that this isn't a thing of like, well, it's just, you know, the little guy can't get this done or that there's some sort of pecking order. It's just a systemic problem that, yeah, that is such a horrible bureaucracy that even somebody as trained and resourced mm -hmm. with the history and all of the knowledge that you and your family have of the area and every law in the book that you could possibly work in every connection, you've still got this problem. Right? Oh, it's getting worse is the problem. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting to a problem. I mean, you know, uh, it's a real hazard now on many levels, you know, besides what's going in the water, the waterway they're obstructing, and uh, and they just have free will to go out there and use it as a uh, a, a, a landfill, you know, a, a, you know, landfill on the water. They do it, they and they just appear. Well, now I can catch them going out there and trying to take pictures, but you know, you know, I'm I, I'm not here to police. You know, I'm just I'm just saying that uh, they just appear, so they know they can get away with it. There just has to be some kind of accountability. And that's all we're asking for, accountability. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, just, just like we're seeing more people on street corners that we've never seen people on before, um, we're seeing more people living on these boats. I've been going to Crystal River for 30-something years, taking people down there, snorkel with the manatee. In the years past, you'd see a couple, three boats in the bay. Last time I went, there must have been 30, 40 boats. So it's not just here. It's happening all over, and it's, it's America. I mean, these people have found the loophole to um, encroach wherever they feel or whatever. But, you know, we're, we're here to try and figure out ways to make them accountable. And... Um, you know, I think engaging our local law enforcement is going to be the first step. You know, we can make a rec recommendation. They'll, they'll get tired of hearing it. You know, there's, uh, there's nothing else we can do, you know. Um, but uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep talking to the county commissioners and uh, the folks that we know to, to try and make things happen. But uh, it's, it's, we all got to keep voicing our opinions on the matter, you know. And and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And, and Carrie, I, you know, I try, I'm so trying so hard to have a balance with this because everybody's frustration, yes, in some of these cases, and I don't mean all of them, I'm not trying to whitewash it, it's not necessarily like finding a loophole. Sometimes it's crawling into a canoe is a little bit better than sleeping under a bridge. That's the reality of a, a small number of these, and that's why it's like it's so difficult with how do we get the sheriff's department involved in this when they can't even, like, the homeless problem on land. Never did I dream that when I joined the Marine Resources Department that my work as a homeless, a responsible homeless advocate, I'm not somebody that advocates this becoming San Francisco by any means, but trying to get more resources, more assistance, more mental health, et cetera, I never would have dreamed it was going to spill over into this committee and onto our waterways, but yeah. that's where it is. Yeah, definitely. Yes, sir. My thought on a comment that you just made, the, the homeless person sleeping in the canoe, the, the difference is, is that the homeless person sleeping on the curb is way different than a homeless person sleeping in a 40,000-pound yacht comes drifting across and takes out my entire dock and they have no resources to cover that and then when their vessel sinks nobody came to my house you should have seen the oil slick from hurricane michael or sally rather it, it, it was six feet wide across my yard and i'm out there trying to clean that up there, there were no crews that came and did that you know it was horrible. We have pictures of all of it. And it's from the vessels that sunk and all the oil and diesel fuel comes up. There was, there was a six or seven foot dead squad of grass where all of that just laid from the, from the oil coming up there. And it took a long time to get that grass back. But I, I understand what you're saying. And there's, there's homeless people everywhere. I, mean, I, I feel bad for them, but there are resources for them if they choose to follow orders or follow rules. 
and a lot of them are they don't like to follow rules. Unfortunately, so unfortunately, there aren't <laughs> there aren't any resources right now, but. I want you to know that, you know, not all of the homeless advocates, if somebody's breaking a law, they're breaking a law. I mean, I have, I am a homeless advocate, but I have called, I, I call the police when there are laws broken. We have to, we have to do the responsible thing. And, and your right to be free and enjoy your property and your peace of mind and your kids' safety is not something that you have to take a hit on because somebody else is struggling. Uh, it's just not. That's not the way you should be asked to live. And so I didn't want you to hear that as, as me just excusing it away. I get frustrated when there's somebody living in an unpowered boat off of the shoreline in Navy Point and people are running down there at 2 o'clock in the morning to try to do something about it. And it's just I, I, when there isn't anything and it's just like somebody's just looking for a place to sleep. The moment that they are endangering somebody else's property, livelihood, children, that, that it, it can't happen. So in agreement. Thank you. Any other additional comments uh, regarding the um, water waste management public workshop? We hear you. We're going to try and get something done. You know, it's, uh, it's been an issue that's coming to a head for quite a while. Enforcement. These guys break the laws every day. Wish I was that lucky. I break the first one, I get a ticket. All right. So uh, with that, we're going to move on to old business and information updates. Mr. Turpin. We're moving on to old business. Old business. Okay, um, under item five, old business, um, the items that are listed there, uh, A, B, uh, A and B, are um, the links are on the website. Uh, our water quality land management um, manager, uh, he can, uh, he's planning to be here at a, at a future meeting to discuss those. If you have any, any questions at all, you could certainly email those to me and I will uh, send those emails on to uh, Mr. Whip. Item number C, the Perdido Bay boat ramp. We are very close to breaking ground. Uh, we had a few little, little items to attend to. Um, we have to mark the conservation easement that we were required to uh, establish on the wetlands and other uh, areas that we uh, had to use compensatory mitigation for the um, impacts to the wetlands at the boat ramp. The, um, and as I understand the hot sheet, uh, this was an item of Marine Advisory Committee uh, initiative, so I'll, I'll leave that to, to the committee to discuss. Mr. Connor, yes, sir. If I may, I'll, I'll, I'll try and take a stab here at this uh, item D, draft hot sheet topics. Uh, at the last and January meetings, we began to discuss some of these issues. Um, we have a list of, it wasn't clear, three issues that are the primary ones, five issues, three issues with some sub-issues uh, in order to draft a recommendation to the county. Uh, just some clarity I think we should talk about, if not tonight, then the next time. Mm -hmm. Specifically, what we want our um, recommendation to say, and uh, we'll draft it. Okay, thank you. Um, I particularly wasn't here when uh, the draft sheet was put together. I did fill out um, the um, topics of interest to me. Uh, do we have the Seafood Safety Symposium next meeting? Yes, sir. The April meeting is going to be the Seafood Safety Symposium. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess wrapping back in and trying to summarize the, uh, the Waterway Management Workshop, if I may, the, um, the comments that were made here um, are, are um, very helpful as I um, continue to look at the the items in the outline and try to strategize with the, the and it will take the county attorney's help because I'm as a biologist I don't I don't claim to understand legal uh, language 
And um, but I believe that there are several items or approaches that we can take as the county, if, if the Board of County Commissioners will approve, that will be able to address, I think, the majority of the issues. And I think first and foremost, um, I think as we heard tonight, um, if we can enforce the, the rules that exist now, um, perhaps that will um, reduce the number of boats that feel um, that they can come into an area and and behave in a way that's not really consistent with with our our values and our our uh, preferences. Absent people doing the right thing on the on their own, that's where the laws come into effect. But again, unless we have a, a, a an enforcement and a prosecution that follows that enforcement action, then um, the, they're they're just not going to. I don't believe that there's going to be any any substantial improvement. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. And um, with the summertime coming up with these large projects, uh, the boat ramp construction, the uh, artificial reef construction solicitation went out um, this past week. So it's on the street now. And I look to be building reefs um, in the in the summer. So uh, I think that in the in the interim months, the Marine Advisory Committee can certainly, with your outreach into the community of other stakeholders and contacts, and certainly anyone that has any contacts that can um, can be in addition to the the contacts that we have with the sheriff's office to find out, you know, and and I think this is the appropriate time is what what are they intending. Uh, for their summer enforcement to to be this year and as they are hopefully planning that implementation that these issues can be made uh, part of their uh, enforcement plan for their priority issues so um, you know again I, I think that that what uh, what chips mentioned about our efforts at the Florida uh, at the Florida legislature, there are elements in Florida statutes that are specifically identified as non-criminal infractions. And I believe that we have a legitimate argument or a le legitimate request to allow a code enforcement officer to enforce a non-criminal infraction. It doesn't uh, to have a, a, a an enforcement officer whose job it is to enforce against crime to 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 spread them even thinner by having them enforce non-criminal infractions to me that seems counterintuitive um, so that might be a request that that could be made um, you know sometimes when you get that first answer you have to find a way to kind of get go get work your way to yes, and that might be something that we could look. Um, and I encourage you all, um, you know, I consider myself a fairly well-read person, but as I started going through these statutes, and when you go to a statute, you go to something in vessel registration fees, and it takes you to the enforcement, and then that takes you somewhere else and somewhere else. You know, you're, w once you see that this is a a multitude of chapters of Florida statutes really apply to what we're dealing with here. And if, for example, if we can, if we can make the case where we can get a, a code enforcement officer designated by the Board of County Commissioners, and that's where it would have to be made, the Board of County Commissioners would have to designate code enforcement officers to enforce the authority for those items that already exist then we could build upon that. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm seeing a, uh, a viable path for, uh, for me to work with the county attorney to make sure that, again, that, that I'm, not, you know, I'm, I'm not misinterpreting the statute and then work our way towards that yes. And I, I, I would like to get this done, um, you know, certainly in, in the in the next year or so. I think it's going to take a long game when you're working with the Florida legislature. For example, the boating, the, the um, 
Anchorage limitation areas that, that the Florida uh, legislature enacted. That was, I believe it was in 2021. We're in 2023. City of Jacksonville has not even put their signs up yet to enact their anchor limitation area. So that's, that's a process that's taken them well over a year. And they were the first one. City of Hollywood is now in the game. It would be interesting for me to watch their implementation and and as captain clark said i, I know city of jacksonville uh that city county that's a different form of government than we have here the city and county are combined into one they have a lot of of enforcement resources on those waterways if you've ever been to jacksonville that's something that you'll you'll you're it's obvious to you so i i would like to see them and their success and i would certainly like to emulate and 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 uh, follow the success of these other counties. So um, I would like to also um, uh, mention that that uh, Phil Horning signed off. He's on Eastern Time, so he asked me to thank everyone and thank the people in the in the public that came and and provided their their uh, input. He thought that the summary, the outline that that I've provided here, is a very valuable tool to start utilizing to. To, to build, we're actually building a building. You know, we're, we're building a structure and these are the elements of that structure. They need to be put in the right place at the right time with the right, you know, at, with the right order so that we can get a handle on this. And he thought that we, we stand a really good chance. I asked him the simple question, is there a county that is doing this right? Or is, it, or, you know, are we all in this, in this battle together? So he his his response was that that when he talks to other counties that are having problems, he lets them know what we're doing over here. So he <laughs> said between between what we're doing and City of Jacksonville and down there in Hollywood that um, that we're really leading the state. The Duval County, Monroe County, I'm sorry, Monroe County and the Keys, there is a lot of attention that the state agencies are putting in that. And when, you, and when you read the statute, you see Monroe County is specifically- uh, They're all over the place. Call, called out in the, in the statute. So that to me shows that it can be done, but it takes, for that effort, it takes the state agency to literally put a preference on that. So, Robert, that was really important because that got, this gets to, I want to back up to what you said, because this gets to Clint's question, which of course is on the face of it, just the important question that he asked Chips. When Chips was talking about come, running up against a dead end at FAC with giving county officers jurisdiction to do stuff in the water, that they could very well do on land. Are you saying that you do think that there's room for code, not necessarily the cr criminal, I mean, uh, enforcement, but that you think that there is room to get to yes on having some code enforcement abilities out in the state waters? And, and I may be suffering from, from a, a, uh, uh, an enhanced optimism here, but I, I believe there. I believe that I, I do. I do. I think that it a reasonable member of the Florida legislature, when given the right proposal, the right background information showing these pictures of these these structures and these vessels, you know that that were were sunk time after time. You know, one one big Chris craft that had five boats around it, one filled to literally within inches of the waterline with garbage. With no registration on it. You know, I don't believe, and this is my personal belief, but I do not believe that the Florida legislature nor the Florida Constitution intends for people to anchor a boat full of garbage on the state sovereign submerged lands on state waterways. I do not believe that that, that, was, that is their intent. What we have to find a way is to weed out the bad, and I think Barry said it perfectly, there are, there are great 
people that are on these waterways that are doing it right. We have an example of the best and the worst. And it should be obvious to even the most um, uh, casual observer that this is, this is good and this is bad. <laughs> so, so but, but Phil did his last word, his parting words to me was that we have to be careful because if we are, if we, if we go too far and the courts find that we have violated someone's constitutional rights, we're going to be buying them a boat. And it's happened before in the state of Florida, at least twice that I know of. I do not want us to be that third case. So we, we have to, we have to have good, good attorney, um, uh, advice and good guidance. And we have to have the Florida legislature determine that it's in the best interest of the citizens of the state of Florida to promote the, the, the valuable uses of our, of our waterways and to prohibit those uses of our waterways that are abusive. So let's just, let's start calling them abuses. So these are abusive behaviors. You can't park your motor home at, at Blackwater State Forest and leave it there and use it as a hunting camp and let it rust into the ground, let the fuel tank fall out and, 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 and leak gasoline on the ground. You'd never, they'd never let you do that. <laughs> And it, when you look in the division of state lands, there is, to me, I, I see no difference. The state owns those lands. They, the state owns those lands, and they cl claim jurisdiction of those waterways. So I think that there is. Thank you. Yeah, uh, to, to begin to wrap up, we hope, here... Um, if there's no objections from the committee, uh, I'd like to take this and incorporate the gist of it, at least the text, maybe not the entire thing, as an appendix in our uh, draft strategic plan. And I'll just do that, put it, put it in the text, you know, so that it's in, in there. And then another little administrative issue. Uh, we are due for elections, I believe, on this committee uh, at some point pretty soon. So if we don't have time Next month, we should be prepared for that uh, soon. So that's just a marker uh, to put forward as an administrative note. Good reminder. Thank you. <laughs> Very good reminder. You can get we're, released. We're a little bit overdue, aren't we? Yes, we are. <clears throat> um, but um, uh, Glenn wanted to, to, to talk about the hot sheets and, and the topics and um, I love incorporating this in here. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, we've been sitting here listening. There's a, there's a groundswell of, of a problem that we've been looking at for, what, two years now, three years? A groundswell. And it's going to get worse. And um, with, with the fact in mind that uh, we made an effort last year to, to get code enforcement the ability to, to enforce marine um, environment uh, regulations, why don't we, I'm, I'm prepared to make it a, a, a recommendation to the county commissioners that we uh, look into uh, um, developing marine code enforcement and, um, you know, the, the, the hot topic sheet was designed to make the county commissioners aware of what we were feeling and, and experiencing as the most pressing issues, right? So I, I'm prepared to um, make a recommendation to the county commissioners that we look into marine code enforcement for this issue specifically and um, possibly um, tapping into the congressional um, folks from the county level. You know, if, if a recommendation from this committee would help in that manner. Robert, is Commissioner Bender going to be at FAC this year with Commissioner May? Do you know who all's going to FAC? No, but no, ma'am. But I bet Chips does. So I mean, we can we can certainly if if um, if if I could ask the the Marine Advisory Committee if you would please delve into the details here so that we're all understanding 
the the opportunities and limitations because there are there are pretty strict um, uh, limitations on what we can do. So when we ask for exemptions to that, we need to be very specific about what actions we're we're requesting and. Um, the, the discussion about the criminal aspects of derelict vessel enforcement, that's what, uh, according to Phil, he said that's, that's probably what, um, what hurt us uh, with the Florida legislature. The, the Florida Association of Counties thought it was a great idea, um, as, as the information that was brought back to me, is that the Florida Association of the Counties uh, probably... Uh, could use our help and maybe the help of, of other counties to craft a, a proposal and a request with good background information and say, this is why. And pictures speak a thousand words. So we'll have pictures next, next time and we'll start honing that down. But I encourage you all to look at Florida statutes. You'll be amazed at what code enforcement officers can and cannot do. Um, and then I will take the 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 uh, the the legal um, analysis request to the county attorney. Are you talking about the terrestrial code enforcement officers, the ones that we have now? What they can and cannot do? I know they carry a gun. No. The city ones. Yeah, city city code enforcement. They're not ours. Our our county code enforcement officers are not sworn law enforcement officers. So some of this is happening in the city. Bayou Chico is the the city county boundary is Bayou Chico. Mm -hmm. So Gary, I certainly support what you're saying in terms of like, can we just get it onto the agenda for next time? Yeah, we've got the seafood symposium, but this is something people are coming and coming for. So I think we need to prioritize it and put it on the agenda. Hot topics, you know, bylaws, um, six year plan all of it, let's break this out and, and, and have a good conversation about this and maybe Glenn could do us the service of making sure early, um, you know, within the next couple of days so that people have enough chance to digest it. Those folks that weren't here, I want to hear what Pete and, and, and Mr. Denby and, you know, all, all of the people that are gone, hopefully we can snag those people and have them here with us next time and have a really good discussion of that um, and see if we can't get closer after using these statutes and stuff that Robert has given us to figuring out where we, listening to the public as well, are comfortable with constitutionally but still protecting people's private property, et cetera. Because remember, we're going to be advocating for this thing. We're going to be, we're going to own it. So we better be really careful about being comfortable with where we want to suggest the parameters to be. Unless we just want to say something that says, you know, um, just supporting Robert in pursuing the conversations and saying that, you know, the committee is going to start, you know, coming and advocating this for, for this to the BCC. But if we are going to be making particular recommendations, certainly people need a chance to look at this stuff, and I want to hear from the people that aren't here as well. So what do you think? Add it to the agenda? Well, it's going to be on the agenda under derelict vessels, right? No, I think I would go with a different agenda item, something more particular toward uh, supporting Robert. You know, in, in speaking with Chips earlier, I got the impression that he's actually going to reach out to county legal. And maybe address some of the questions we've had. So I know there's a lot of there's a lot of feedback, you know, as Mel saying as well, a lot of feedback coming back in that I would like to get our hands on. I want to know what the county, you know, what their responsibility is out there before we start trying to. Yes, I think code enforcement is a great avenue to go in, but you know, but I don't want to throw it all on that guy when you know when maybe our own sheriff's department, county marine unit, could be doing more than they're doing. So I do want to find out the availability of of what we already have. And so when we go to the to the Board of County Commissioners, we're a little more informed and educated with this, 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 and this in a row, as opposed to emotional after a uh, heated discussion here with the public. 
And, and I don't think it's just Robert's job to advocate to, to get the, the Sheriff's Department a representative um, here. I mean, that, that's what we're here to do as well. So if any of us, I'm sure that everybody up here knows someone in the Sheriff's Department. And if we've got relationships that we can continue to try to, you know, assist Robert and the county with getting a little bit more interest in having somebody here, um, to have a real earnest discussion about what they're a, a what they can do, b what they're willing to do, and c what what they're funded to do, and d if they're not, then well, how do we get them the funding they need? Right. And, and and thank you, Mel and, and Robert. You would probably give us better advice. Is I, I wouldn't leave this under derelict vessels. I would consider it more of a waterway enforcement agenda item, <clears throat> something that something that's in its own independence. You know, we don't control derelict vessels. That's run by the state, but we can we can navigate our own way through a, a county a waterway enforcement opportunity. Whether we make a in, in one or two months, we make a recommendation to the BCC or not. Okay, What's so that? we do add it to the agenda, huh? I would suggest just use waterway management. That's what we've been yeah calling it okay. all we'll along. Make, we'll make it a bullet item underneath that. Derelict vessels in particular. Mr. Um, Conrad. Thank you. Uh, actually, if Melissa would agree to it, I would make a motion here that she'd write up what she'd like us to see uh, and pro provide that at the next agenda, uh, at the next meeting. Uh, ahead of time. And, and, On and which pass, thing, Glenn? And pass it to well, what you just described as far as what you would like to have out uh, within a couple of days. Write it up, pass it through the uh, county staff, and, this, and they can distribute it. This. I was just talking about this, Glenn, making sure that the people who aren't here. Did I miss this? Because I think Robert just gave us a hard I, I, copy of this tonight. I, but I think that will that will become, uh, unless there's any, any uh, uh, dissent on this, uh, I'm going to ask the county uh, now to provide us with an electronic copy of that, and I'll include it with the uh, distribution. Yeah, so that was so all. I like no, I'm else, sorry, please. Glenn. I wasn't trying to put any work off on you for formulating anything. It's just that I didn't think that this was living anywhere electronically. So I meant if you could get this out to the committee members that aren't here and let them, well, everybody, yeah, and let them know that we're going to discuss be on our, meeting, yeah. our minutes for tonight, right? I just sent it to you in an email. So it'll yeah, be I'm, your... I'm sorry I didn't communicate that well. I just Fair meant enough. before, like the couple of days before, because there's so many statutes in here that are listed that people can then, you yeah. know, look into. So we're going to move on from the uh, draft hot sheet topics for this evening. We got um, new business. It's all pretty new. Carrie, you weren't here last time. At some point, I would like to get around to um, a discussion. Rick uh, O'Connor was interested. He had talked to somebody in the extension department last time. I provided a paper copy. I should have had electronic of the the thing that is the offshore aquaculture. The aquaculture thing. Mm -hmm. It, probably too much next time, but it should be on our radar. And I wanted to hear from. You know, I wanted to f hear from Brady and some the Fisher people, you know, f people that... Did you distribute that to the audience as well? I didn't. Time? I didn't because we were running out of time, and so I just had paper things, so I just kind of tossed them around and said that at some point, uh, whenever people are ready, I'd really love to have... Um, I want to hear from people, because I've heard both sides. Perhaps this some is of the horrible. At the this is fine. safety symposium might be able to weigh Oh, in awesome. Well. I love that. You know? I love that, yep. Yeah. Sweet. Um, Glenn, I, I'll dig up what it was that I had circulated and send you a copy of that. And I'll get with Christian Wagley, too, because this is one of his things. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Rick and just see if there are materials that people would like to circulate around ahead of time on that. Yeah, I, actually, Melissa, if you'd send that to uh, the county, and then I can forward that on to everybody. Uh, they'll send it out to me, and they can... Uh, uh, Add that to the item as because they're structuring a seafood safety symposium speakers we are not so yeah if it's an invite to rick o'connor or somebody else then they need to they need to be the ones that do that 
I'm not sure what you're talking about, Glenn. Sorry, repeat it. The aquaculture paper that you're talking about? Right. Yeah, if you'll forward that to the county electronically, I'll forward it to us, but then they should be the ones to add it to the seafood safety. Oh, I, yeah, I see what you're saying. Nope, again, I wasn't trying to say that we intrude on Robert's territory with the seafood symposium. I just thought that um, St. Karamet, there's going to be so many of those folks here. Maybe, maybe we could... I think it's a topic, yeah. Yeah. And just to, to let y'all know, I don't I don't consider that my territory at all. I think it's the the the, the seafood safety symposium is uh, is something that we've done over a number of years, and um, you know I welcome any anyone that that wants to speak on any topic. I have invited um, a, a woman from the division of aquaculture. She made a presentation at a recent uh, meeting I attended uh, regarding uh, shellfish aquaculture. And although this is not exactly the same environment, it's, it's conceptually within the same orbit. And if she has no direct uh, information for us, she may know someone who who has that information. So, um, Robert, do you have any interest in working that topic? Uh, this isn't a passive aggressive way of trying to get it in there. It's an honest question. Do you have any interest in having that be a part of the symposium, or would you prefer if we deal with that, it happens separately from the symposium? No, I don't have a problem at all. You know, whatever whatever the Marine Advisory Committee. Um, you know, I, 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 I like to, to think that we're, and when we do these symposia, that we're doing them collaboratively and, and you know, we're using, um, I think, everyone's resources best when we bring items that are relevant, current, and um, can be, uh, can go to subject matter experts. And I, I know Mike Lewis has a, has a, a lot of academic credibility. Um, and perhaps he actually might have some contacts in in uh, in the offshore. I know that the the Offshore Aquaculture Act was an act of the legislature, so um, I, I I did put him on the spot quite a bit here, but um, no more than than I think he could he can um, you know certainly provide us his his thoughts on on the scientific because I think that's what you're asking is is you're looking for scientific. Um, uh, uh, background so that we can all make informed decisions on whether or not we would support or, um, if if necessary, oppose something. I don't even know if there's a mechanism to oppose this. Yeah, at this like, time, literally, I, I like just was yeah, just just hearing from people who know better about it. Literally, Robert, all the further I had gotten as I've talked to Christian, I talked to Brady, I talked to Rick. And Rick said that he thought that there was somebody at Extension that would be really interested in talking about it. And that's, that's like as far as it went. So there wasn't any, you know, truly formed idea about which direction to take it, other than it seems like something that is important for folks to know about even. I don't know how many people know. I didn't. I, I don't know how, how many people are aware in the community that they're thinking about doing this. Surely people should at least know that it's it's a possibility, if nothing more. Yeah, Mike, do you have any contacts in the in the world of offshore aquaculture or the effects of that? No, not really. Uh, I know for this year's symposium, I would suggest instead of not much has changed since last year. If people are interested in the safety of the seafood, I don't think there's much change there. I think this is a good topic. Uh, I think a, a seafood symposium this year should address emerging topics in this area, not so much this fish has mercury and da 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 da, because I don't think that's changed that much in a year. Uh, but <laughs> I'm going to throw this out. I, unfortunately, I've been I've been retired three years. I'm kind of out of the loop. Uh, Matt Posner, Rick, um, Matt and his his old group. I'm sure they've got individuals in this area uh, on aquaculture and things of that nature. Uh, one thing that might be interesting is, I don't know what the status now of this oyster commercial uh, harvesting and uh, rearing of oysters in Scambia Bay and East Bay. I don't know where that is. That might be a good individual. If that business is even still going, mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure if it is, but you that, need it well, I don't know if it's still in existence. That would be one good topic because they have a lot of practical experience with vandalism and everything else that's gone wrong. I think whoever's running that show now uh, would be interesting to have. That, to me, it would be very interesting uh, to have somebody like that. Uh, but as far as uh, it, the only other thing is, I mean, it gets really into the scientific genetic. Uh, they're doing DNA, uh, DNA analysis of even fishes, seafood in restaurants uh, to get the exact species you're ordering, which would have a, an effect on the, your interpretation of the tissue quality. It may not even be a, a, a redfish or whatever. That might be another. It could be. It, they're selling all kinds of mixed species as such. That'd be another good topic, but I don't know who to go to on that. Uh, so. To me, I, if I was in the public, I'd be more interested in what are the contemporary topics going on. Maybe have somebody in Mass Shop that's doing wrote up that in their uh, in their document. You know, maybe have one presentation, da 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 da. But it's not going to show much change than the stuff that we presented last year. But but have an element of that. But aquaculture would be good, and I think this individual from if that oyster company is still in progress. Uh, would be good. DNA analysis, I'm throwing out topics without people, <laughs> but uh, you know, UW, uh, UWF might be a good resource, uh, Rick would be a good resource, Matt would be a good resource, and one of the one of the things that I've lost contact for, even when I was working, is FDEP, what are they doing? Uh, and again, I don't know, if the people that I used to work with, they're all retired at best, or <laughs> pushing the daisies. But uh, my contacts are pretty much long gone. The reason I, I, I thought of you was because of the location of this. It's in, it's in federal waters, so it would, it would fall under regulation under the Clean Water Act, right. as well as the Coast, Coastal Zone uh, Protection Act. But that's why I was thinking of, of, of EPA when, when I thought, okay, the, the Clean Water Act, because really you got, you got several different real real areas of, of concern. You've yeah. got the, the nutrient pollution, um, contamination of, of uh, the surrounding waters by any kind of, of medication that they apply. Yeah. And then you've got the genetic, the potential for genetic pollution regarding, you know, non-native species, uh, uh, hatchery raised species, potentially hybrid, hybridized GMOs. So there are th those to me as I as I kind of think about this, and I, I think it's I, a great topic. I yeah. just don't know. And that new species of whale, Robert, um, it's in the habitat mm -hmm. for. Remind me, what is the new, um, the newly identified yeah, the subspecies? Rices. The, the, yeah. Rices whale. Yeah. It's a it's the it's a subspecies of the of Brutus whale. Which is literally where they're planning on putting that is kind of its only habitat in the world, right? Or the place that it's most known at any rate, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's off the shelf edge, but they're, the, the, um, that, that part of it, I would, I, I would not, um, I mean, certainly everyone can have input there, but the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act will have very scientifically uh, rigorous discussion and analysis. They'll have subject matter experts that are way above, um, you know, anyone that, that, that I know regarding that. So I'll have to have faith and confidence in that element of the analysis will, will have to occur because that'll be at National Marine Fishery Service. And, um, but the things that, that I think are more really in terms of the seafood safety are the those three elements of the uh, of the and for lack of a better word the the, the pollution of, of you, know. well, you have that big clam you know in the bend area mm -hmm. all the clam production now Cedar Key. yeah I mean and that's a great success that's been really a great success and then the oyster thing here's been relatively a bust but I, I just don't from my days, I really didn't dwell on that issue that much, and I haven't kept up with the literature. I would suggest just 
asking Matt, number one, he must have contacts in FDEP. Somebody from the state would be good in that. Um, EPA now, where I came from, they don't, they've changed direction almost totally. Uh, I could make a call out there, but I know they I already know they're not going to have anybody that's in this area anymore. So it's kind of a, I'm not much help in this this year. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm, is I'm the getting old. <laughs> I'm losing all my contacts. I, I just don't, uh, I would turn to Matt, and they've got a lot of folks, and I could, I mean, they, they have a lot of outreach programs in academia in Alabama, within Easy Drive, Mobile area, Dauphin mm -hmm. Island. I'm sure there's people over there that are doing research in this area, and ask him if he's got some names and people, and I think we could get two or three people out of there, UWF's. Jane, I can't think of her last name. Jaffrey. Jaffrey. Uh, she's done a lot of work with nutrients, I know, in this area, <clears throat> and I'm sure she's still working there. But she might be a point of contact in UWF, and she might find some, some other folks that she knows that deal directly with this issue. But as far as, like we did last year, uh, I thought the presentations were real well. I, I mean, very interesting. Rick gave a real interesting of all the regulatory. I think that one would be a good repeat. Uh, Rick O'Connor? Yeah, on the regulatory, what oysters have to go through to get approved for consumption and that type of thing. I thought that was real helpful. I learned a lot myself. So that would be a good one. Uh, the oyster, I, I think the oyster thing would be really fabulous if you could get someone here because they had their ups and downs and they had the involvement of Auburn University and experts up in that neck of the woods helping this business. <clears throat> and the last I read it was floundering for a variety yeah, of reasons. They just lost a bunch of harvestable area too, right, at their last meeting. Didn't yeah, they? yeah, the, the, uh, the girl that will be here, the, the woman that I've invited, uh, when she gave her presentation at the at the oyster meeting, she uh, she showed the map of the recent uh, constriction of the conditionally approved areas for oyster harvesting oh. here. I mean, and that that to me, that's the the oyster is the canary in the coal mine for you know how how well are you protecting the water quality um, in your in your estuary because the oyster it can't move. Yeah. So if if it if it can't get out of the way and because it filters and we eat that as part of when we eat the oyster, you know it's it's very very highly regulated and in, in, in terms of a, a of seafood safety and protection, I would say it would be difficult for me to think of a species locally that would that would have that would exceed that level of protection. And her presentation was really really good. And I would I'm. I'm I've touched base with her, and she's she's committed. She was she may be on 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 online if we can't get her travel done, but she's she's going to be good, and she'll be able to handle. I think the the uh, the aquaculture, and I'll let Mark reach out to some of his contacts uh, with the marine mammal folks. And um, well, if I think of anything, I'll, I'll send you an email. And I will tell you that that I've invited Keith Milley from FWC because we're still monitoring the the, the reef fish on the Oriskany for PCBs. And this year, or, or, or last year, uh, due to the fact that we were unable to collect enough species and individuals to, to have a statistically valid uh, sample, um, we, we actually uh, took lionfish. Yeah. And we're, we're, I mean, I sent another email today. I'm expecting my lionfish PCB tissue concentrations any day now. Should have happened, should have happened last week, but we'll have that. And, you know, that's, to me, that's a, that's a really good species for what we're doing. I'm not going to give his, give our talk ahead of time, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what those tissue levels are. So, yeah, there's, there's one thing you. related to that. I mean, this has been going on for five, six years, and I've dealt a little bit with it, but I just heard a thing today on, PBS or PFAS forever chemicals and these are getting more serious and more serious they had some sob, not, I shouldn't say this some sob stories of people living near this plant I forget where it was not sob stories I mean it's they were criminally contaminated with this substance extremely toxic now EPA has been worried about this for 10 years they'll have done a lot about it but now 
things are starting to turn. Uh, so it's going to be a regulated chemical, extremely toxic. Uh, it's, it, once it's in you, it's, they say it's in 99% of all humans right now. Mm -hmm. And this is the Teflon issue that's evolved in the waterproofing of garments. These chemicals are everywhere. Skillets. Skillets. That's the, they, they put Teflon it, in skillets and told everybody to cook in it. Yeah, it's called the son of Teflon, but it's evolved in garments. Uh, rainwear makes waterproofing and fireproofing is another chemical. But it'd be interesting, FDEP, depending <laughs> on them, what are they doing about it in this area? Are they monitoring it? Uh, you know, it's called chemicals of emerging concern. Well, this thing is of great concern. And I don't know if anybody's have any information for here but maybe in other areas of Florida, uh, really in dense urbanized areas, they may be monitoring this. So I mean, maybe a quick call to FDEP to find out, hey, this because it is a hot topic, and I'm, I'm sure the public would like to. Uh, I would think drinking water standards oh, would be the place because we're, I mean, we're all drinking. That's right. It's a everywhere. lot more water than 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 we're eating yeah. seafood, so. Whatever happened to the ECUA lawsuit over 3M injecting that stuff under the sandy bottom aquifer? That was the six years, five years That's ago was the last time I heard anything about that. Is that even still going? As far as I know, I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything either. Robert, how many years since you guys haven't been had enough out at the, the Oriskany to do your actual proper count? One more thing I forgot about during COVID, because you haven't given that presentation in a while, have you? Has it been a few years since you guys have actually had enough out there that you could, it was statistically viable? Yeah. I'll have to look back, um, but you know, I usually give an update every, um, every seafood safety symposium has that in there. I mean, I, I, do, I do presentations at fishing rodeos and we've got a survey that we've done. Actually, the, to me, the, the, um, the most relevant information that that i've been able to acquire through uh, and i wouldn't i wouldn't say that it's, it's uh, a, a real rigorous statistics because we're we're sampling a stratified population of people that are attending uh, fishing rodeos but i have my interns come up and we have a survey we ask people are you aware of the of the uh, uh, existence of the uh, state of florida department of health's uh, fish consumption guidelines do you use those? Are you aware that that you know that the that these species and there's a consumption for every species out there for methylmercury, yeah. and then some of these others are just adding to the 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 um, list of concerns. But you know we're I'm I'm trying to stay in the lane of marine resources and seafood safety. A lot of this stuff, um, you know, if it if it's if it's <clears throat> If it is of interest to the Marine Advisory Committee and the public, then I think that um, you know there's there's certainly room for more than one uh, symposium a year for uh, something like seafood safety. I think the month is it the month of October is seafood month or something like that. So between everything that we're doing, I mean we're doing we're doing diving safety, we're doing no. <laughs> seafood safety, we're doing waterway management. I think we're 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 doing a lot. You know, and, and I think it's it's really relevant. I think it's important, and um, you know, if we need to do more, then you know, just let me know, and we'll 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 do more. I've got I, I've already talked to Rick about the uh, about the symposium and invited him to uh, to participate. I'll get up with Matt Posner. Jane Caffrey's, I believe she's on sabbatical, a research sabbatical. Oh, so I'll, I'll try to get, get up with her, but it may be that uh, maybe Wade Jeffries, because uh, he's at CEDB. Yeah. So maybe, maybe he can come out and help. And I'll have FWC, and um, we'll just we'll, we'll see who we, who we end up with. And so. Robert, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, if you, uh, you've got enough to corral. So if you want to ask Rick O'Connor who that person was at Extension about that, you know, thing going, the, the potential of that farm uh, going off the Pensacola Beach, or, or if you want to talk to Christian, if you want me to talk to him, I'm happy to. Otherwise, I'm just going to let you roll with what you've got planned. Yeah, I'll... 
what I'll do is I'm going to ask the, the person that I've already invited from the Division of Aquaculture to, uh, to, 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 um, to, and giving her a month in advance, perhaps at least she can give us something on it, or I will invite her if she wants to have, um, if there are any, um, any other subject matter ex experts in the Division of Aquaculture, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, as I'm sitting here thinking about this, you know, again, it's in federal waters, so I'm not sure how much the state of Florida Division of Aquaculture, unless they were in a in a consultative capacity under the Coastal Zone Management Act, I, I, I just don't know. So we'll see. Cobia. If they raise cobia. We could just collect the buckets from Bayou Chico, take them out there, solve two problems. I love Kobe too. Any anybody else in the public would like to speak? No. Nope. We lost him. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any committee members have any additional topics they'd like to discuss additionally? Forever? Any more? Uh, we have a motion for adjournment by Ms. Kathy Watson. Second. Second by Mr. Conrad. Third. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Adjourned at 812. Yes, sir. Robert, did you know your old boss used to be a substitute teacher?